having a discussion. Oh, it's at item number seven, appoint official voting representative for the League of Cities and Towns annual meeting. Um, so, I mean, we can, I suppose we could still like briefly talk about that if you want when we get there, but otherwise I think it's kind of a non, yeah. non item. Um, no, oh, hi, she has to take it off. Okay. Uh, Joe, what's up? I got a last just today delivered to me another uh, liquor license application, a second class application for the Savoy Theater. So if we can toss that in with the other one on the consent agenda, that would be awesome. Okay. And they'll be at the uh, <clears throat> police station tomorrow? Absolutely. Along with all the warrants. All the warrants, yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, so any other changes to the consent, or not to the consent, to the uh, agenda in general? Okay, great. So without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council about any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And uh, yeah, if you'd say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be excellent. And uh, yeah, so would anybody like to address the council? So you can either turn your camera on and give a little wave or you can use the hand emoji so we know that you would like to speak. Uh, Stephen Whitaker here. Yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I am uh, taken aback that after all that work two weeks ago, uh, the uh, issue of the public restrooms didn't even make it onto the agenda for discussion. I sense that the council got it, some sense that there's an emergency here. There's a pandemic. There's nowhere for people to wash their hands. You know, people are crapping in the streets. In, and, and you just, like, treat it as if it's, you know, Someday we'll think about it. We'll talk about it, and it's outrageous, and it's a crisis. I've, I've escalated to the health commissioner already. The city council needs to take this seriously instead of spending a quarter million dollar on fluffy signs for businesses that aren't here anymore. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, just thinking about that, was there any, because we did talk about short-term things, when um, were we going to, I, I know we were going to revisit that with um, potentially as a budget item, um, were we, what are your thoughts on addressing that any sooner? Cameron? Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. I have pulled together um, some internal folks and we are working on a proposal for y'all of a couple different options that we've been investigating. They might not all be budgetarily feasible, right now, but we're looking at both short-term and long-term options for you to consider. We'll have that by your next meeting. Great. Great. Thank you for that update. Uh, anybody else? Okie dokie. All right, and Cameron doesn't see anyone. So, uh, all right, so on to the consent agenda. So um, is and we're understanding that this includes uh, the liquor license for the Savoy Theater. Um, any other motion regarding the consent agenda? Go ahead, Jack. I move the consent agenda as amended uh, tonight. Okay, uh, motion in a second. Any further discussion? I have one quick uh, yes, question. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the coming street where it's changing to gravel, just as a clarification, is that until the water main is replaced and then it would be repaved? So it's a, a temporary situation, is that correct? That's correct. It'll be newly paved and improved. Okay. That's all uh, I have. Any other, okay. any other um, thoughts on or discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Oh, and opposed. Um, all right, so the consent agenda passes, and we are on to uh, the Homelessness Task Force appointment. And I think we had one vacancy and uh, one 
um, applicant, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I don't see Diane necessarily on right now. Um, so, uh, we do. So yeah. What, what's your pleasure council? Uh, Jack. I move we go into executive session to discuss the appointment of a public official. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. And opposed. Okay, so we are gonna um, hop off this call, though the line will still remain open. And we will return to this same line uh, uh, in, in, in a bit. All right, we'll see you soon. Uh -huh. I think we have a Donna. And we're ready. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so Donna, we just came out of executive session, but we have not yet taken a vote yet. So just FYI. Um, all right, is there a motion? Yes, Dan. So uh, I move that we appoint uh, Diane Matthews to the homelessness task force to the vacant position for which she has applied. I'll second it. Okay, um, get a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right. So um, thank you to Diane for uh, stepping up to serve on this committee. Um, all right. So we are, um, I guess we're skipping item seven, um, unless you want to say anything about that, Donna. No. Okay. I mean, other than uh, the actual... It was about the town fair and being the delegate. Oh, okay. And because it was on Zoom this year, the Vermont League of City and Towns divided up the business portion, which was this week today, and the fair, which is next week. And I registered for one, but I had some problems getting authorization to vote in today's meeting. So I ended up not being omitted. <laughs> so next year, we'll plan ahead. Hopefully they should be back in person. <laughs> who knows <laughs> who knows and hopefully Indeed. but people should uh okay so it is free and people should consider zooming in for a few sessions next week that's all thank you all right so uh, the next item is a discussion about the central Vermont public safety authority and um the potential appointments to that but we don't um, have any appointments to make this evening? Um, I think we're just talking about it generally. Um, so for this, I, I'm turning it over either to Bill or to Donna. Um, I'm not sure who. I would, so I could just quickly say that we, we do have two vacant positions uh, on the committee. Um, and we've advertised for them a new number of times, uh, both Donna is, is one of our reps, and Kim Cheney is our elected rep uh, and the current chair, have spoken to me about this and had asked that this be on the council agenda to discuss the situation, maybe the CVPSA in general. So I'll turn it over to either one of them. Just a correction there, Bill. I'm actually not an appointed from the city council any longer. I got on the ballot in March, so I'm an at-large. Yes, correct. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. And part of my doing that is I was hoping to free up spaces because I do think that particularly as we're getting so much into equipment and expertise of public safety staff, I feel is essential to be on the board. Other regional public safety groups have their chiefs on their board. I mean, only their chiefs, actually. So I just felt that it was a good time to do that. We're looking at this needs assessment. It's going to be coming back. A lot of technical aspects that we all can, on the board can learn from, but it's really better if you have some, I think, base expertise there. And commitment. The one thing that I've felt missing from Montpelier is we have a lot of opinions, but we we haven't voted for any commitment to see it through. So I hoped that if we had some staff on the board, we could get that commitment. And I understand Bill feels there's a conflict, I, and I can respect that. I was just hoping that maybe we could do something with staff. 
There have been some staff members that have volunteered to oversee the consultant once we hire them, and that's much appreciated. So as they do their work, there's somebody there knowing if it's completed and completed the way we want it. But I do feel that the Public Safety Authority Board has been stymated because there's been two empties vacancies in on the Montpelier side and one in Barrie. So it would be really appreciative if we could put somebody on. Uh, Dan Richardson had his arm twisted and would consider it. And I, you know, I would like to propose him even though I didn't do an official nomination, but if uh, that would be the pleasure of the council and Dan's still saying yes, that he'd be willing to try it out and add another voice to the table as we go forward in choosing this vendor and seeing this need assessment done for all of Central Vermont towns because their communication is light years behind. <laughs> and it's really time to get everything updated and make public safety communication more, not, not, you know, not of the most expensive, not the, but much better than it is, and moving us into the 21st century. And I think this is a good time. The state's new public safety commissioner is really has an interest in regional dispatch centers. He has an interest in the state sharing some of the costs. So I, I think this is a good time to get our need assessment done. So then we can go to the state and the towns and say, this is what we need. This is why we need it. And this is what you have now. And this is how we get from where we are to where we want to be. So I would love to have Dan aboard. And if you're still willing, I'll nominate you. <laughs> you want to speak? Sure. Um... No, I'm, I'm, I, and I've had conversations with you, Donna, and I've had conversations with Kim uh, as well. Um, and I'm certainly willing to step up in, in part because I, I, as you put it and very, put it very well, which is that, um, you know, there are, there is this point of a needs assessment and understanding how to integrate some of these communication systems in the region uh, as dispatch and as, as needs become more um, more integrated rather than less. I mean, the idea that we exist as these little fiefdoms separated and uh, it, out of communication is just not a reality. So I'm, I'm happy to step up forward. I, I can't make a, you know, I'm not gonna make a long-term commitment, <laughs> but I will certainly serve and hopefully add, add to the voice uh, of Montpelier in this because obviously we have a big stake in this. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to step forward. Of course, if anyone else on the council has a greater <laughs> burning desire, um, I'm happy to withdraw in in lieu of that individual, uh, whoever he or she may be. Oh, but we have two seats, Dan. They can oh, join you. Well, I'm, I'm expecting a, a, a stampede of names <laughs> to come forward. Is what. Well, I'm looking for a second to my nomination of Dan. I'll second that. <laughs> Okay. Um, any further discussion? Um, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Well, uh, I'll recuse myself for. Uh... <laughs> and uh, yes, Donna, go ahead. Well, uh, because there's a board, a public safety board meeting tomorrow night, I've already talked to John Odom, and he is willing to do the oath. And we could either do it right now, quick, or at the end of city council meeting, whichever is your and the mayor's pleasure. But you do need to take a swearing in in order to attend and vote tomorrow. Hmm. Um, I think we should probably do that at the end. Is that okay? okay? That's we'll fine. all still be here. So. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank we, you. We just can't forget. Yeah, um, Dan, don't forget, Dan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Are you willing to take public comment on this topic? Absolutely. Go ahead, Stephen. Well, I I think that Donna has articulated well the the problem, the stagnation that has occurred due to. Uh, I only realized recently that very uh, folk officials. Uh, have safety issues, not dissimilar to Montpelier, but we just don't talk about them here in Montpelier, where the radios don't work. And they resented paying uh, their share of the money, even though it was the voters that appropriated the money to be spent on a study when they have uh, life-threatening uh, lack of communications in certain zones. So I think that's the 
going to be have to be addressed early on in this study. But uh, more importantly, it's the billions of dollars in the well, the how in the coming from Congress that it, that the Treasurer reported to the uh, fiscal committee that we need to have a plan in place uh, by next spring if we intend to draw on any of those grant funds to upgrade any of this infrastructure. So it's very high time that we get get off the dime and get a plan together. Montpelier, it, need, this probably needs to be a half hour on an agenda somewhere or a subcommittee appointed of the council to get into the nitty gritty. Montpelier is in a conflict position with its agreement with Cap West, uh, Capital Fire that does not adhere to open records or public meeting law, and they, in effect, are a contractual obligator of the city, uh, a contractual partner with the city. So we've got, in effect, a a conflict in how we run our dispatch, which will be remedied long-term by the success of CDPSA, but in the meantime, it's an impediment. And that's why I think it's good that the chief uh, may not be on this council, because, there, there are vested interests here that need to be uh, fleshed out and brought into the light and equipment inventories and valuations, et cetera. So I just want the council to be aware of how important this is and that it's been neglected for far too long. That's fine. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, good points. Um, all right. So I think we're ready to move on. Um, so the next item is uh, the potential new p- uh, winter parking uh, strategy or plan. Um, uh, Jack, did you have something? Yes, I just noticed that Kim Cheney just uh, turned off his cloaking device. It is now visible. And so I, oh. <laughs> well, while, while, before we move to the next topic, I just wanted to see if he had anything that he wanted to add to this discussion. Yes, thank you. No obligation, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Donna. Thank you all, and thank you, uh, Dan, for volunteering. This is a critical time, and I really appreciate your support, and I look forward to working with you. I've had some interesting conversations with Chief Pete. And I think we can work together and do something really good for both cities. So thank you all. And thank you, Kim, for all of your time and dedication to this group as well. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, So the the next thing is, um, well, actually, anybody else? (laughs) I don't want to go too quickly here. Um, anyone else want to comment on the CVPSA? Okay. All right. So um, the next item is the winter parking um, plan. So I'm going to turn this over to Donna. Donna Casey. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. The. Um... So Zach Logic is here with me. I want to acknowledge that this um, alternative way of dealing with our winter parking is here before us because of his um, innovation and convincing us that this could be a very good solution to some of the challenges that we have. Um, He will go into greater detail, but I'm just going to hit the high key points of this um, proposed um, ordinance. Um, So first, um, there are, sorry, I just want to find my place. Okay, so um, we've had a variety of people ask us why we're proposing the change. Um, It and these are the reasons why. It is intended to simplify winter parking. Plowing, we know, will be able to be accomplished more efficient, efficiently, and roads and sidewalks will be cleaner because um, it allows us to clear the sides, um, the sidewalks and the sides of the road at the same time that we're clearing um, one side of the road and then moving to the next side. And so we don't have the snow buildup we'll have less, we anticipate we'll have less overtime 
uh, logged throughout the year, which is both critical to um, the city's um, financial situation as well as to our staff's personal um, situation. We end up having people with hundreds of hours of overtime um, towards the end of the year, and that, in my estimation, is not the best op option for managing our staff. Um, we also anticipate that um, once people adjust to the system, we'll have fewer parking tickets issued by the Montpelier Police Department. And the result is that costs to rent, uh, residents will diminish. Um, Public Works, as of today, posted information on our Facebook page, and we'll be continuing to do that. We're inviting residents to um, listen, look, read over the proposed um, new ordinance and to send us their questions. Um, three of them have been posted. Um, we'll post them on Facebook and we'll archive them on our Public Works um, website uh, so that people can review them before they make another ask. Um, we're going to go into more detail tonight answer questions about the proposal, but in its simplest form, the proposal is that on calendar days, having even numbers, parking will occur only on the side of the street that has even numbers on it. Um, and the same will be true for the following day when we ask our um, parking to move to the other side of the street. Um, again, visually, if you can imagine that, um, it makes it so much easier to plow to the curb, clear the sidewalk, and move on. Um, it does require that residents will need to shift their cars uh, to the appropriate side of the street on a daily basis. We've looked into situations of how other communities in the United States who have this kind of ordinance manage it, and there are a variety of different ways. Um, so there's no, no obvious um, preference that was um, determined by that uh, review. So what we're proposing is that um, no earlier than 5 p.m. on any given day, all the cars would move from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, on the night for the following day's side of the street. So if you are parked on an even side, and you get home at six o'clock in the evening and you could just park on the other side of the street and you would be safe for the following day. But you could park anywhere between and move that car anywhere between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. and not be out of sorts with um, the methodology that we're proposing. We do expect that there will be a little bit of confusion at the beginning. We don't anticipate that we'll be issuing um, tickets for um, cars that are parked there a little bit later or a little um, or um, in the evening, but we may be leaving uh, notes on the windshields reminding people of that. We have yet to work that out. Um, if the council does end up adopting this proposal, the alternate side parking, as it's called, will begin on November 15th and end on April 1st. And that's whether or not there's any snow. So if we don't experience snow, we are going to start that on that date in order to get people oriented to the process. Um, there are streets that for a variety of reasons, and Zach will go into this in greater detail, um, can't accom accommodate alternate side parking programs. Um, and depending on what those issues are, there are different rules that will apply. It may sound um, like we're going to have an awful lot of idiosyncrasies, but that's absolutely not true. There's only four different tables that would occur. So I'll go through them really quickly. So there are some streets that absolutely will not allow parking at any time during the winter. Table one in your packet lists those streets. There are streets where cars can only park on odd numbered sides of the street or only park on even number side of the street for the entire time. 
Um, and tables three and four identify those streets. One other exception is where parking meters are located and also in areas nearby schools. Both of those circumstances, there are exceptions to the alternate side parking rule. In those areas, parking is allowed between the daytime hours of 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And table two um, indicates where those streets are. Um, so that's the quick version of that. I'm sure if you've read the ordinance over, and I'm sure you all have, um, that that sounds familiar to you. And Zach can get into more details. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so first of all, I actually have a question. Do I need to physically read the ordinance um, as presented to make this a first reading, or are we set to continue to have a conversation. Yeah, you do not need to read it. Awesome. Uh, so as Donna talked about, we've already gone through the majority of this. Um, on the odd number days, so you park on the odd side of the street, even on the even side of the street. Um, we've gone through and uh, taken each street and tried to find a place, uh, find a appropriate spot for them, uh, meaning table one is there no parking anytime. Table two is the downtown area where daytime parking would be allowed. Table three is the even only, even only, and table four is odd only. Um, I have not, I did not provide a list in your packet of all of the streets that have alternate side parking, uh, but we are, we've been working on that and then I have it in front of me being currently developed. Um, so in areas that you'll you'll see on the no parking list uh, that there is quite a few streets that have no parking all the time. Um, those streets are typically they are narrow or they have a really steep grade, which has been problematic for us to clear, which is why those streets have initially gone into that list. Um, there are we can have discussions about if you feel like a certain street shouldn't be on that list and should be considered for even or uh, odd only or alternate. Um, but we tried to take a stab at what we thought would work um, and operationally and for um, the residents of Montpelier based on what we see with uh, parking counts. So we did go around and do some, some count data to see how, how much parking was utilized on the various streets, uh, which is where we started in terms of where we wanted to allow odd and even side parking. And um, so with that, um, I think we can just open it up to questions, clarifications, and have a little bit of a discussion. Um, this is, we're not, I will tell you that we're not completely, not everything is set in stone here. Um, we can bring things from one table to another, um, but where we are now is uh, having a discussion about um, what we have proposed and if there needs to be changes made. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing um, since that's uh, what this is supposed to be. Uh, and actually just a clarification on this, um, for our procedural purposes, are, are we thinking of this as a first reading of the ordinance? Okay, we are. I just wanted to make sure that that was true. Okay. Um, well, I have just one very small uh, comment. I, well, besides that, I, I think this is great and I am uh, looking forward to this um, being implemented. I think this is going to be a really good thing. And certainly tra the transition will be um, tough. I mean, it's, it'll be a learning curve, uh, but the sooner we can uh, communicate, or actually, I know it's, it's already sort of started to, to get out there, but uh, the more we can promote uh, you know, that this is happening, I think will be, it'll make that transition better. I appreciate the part about uh, 5 to 10 p.m. being the transition time if somebody needed to switch sides of the street, you know, if it's, if it was parked during the day and needs to be on the other side the next time, I think that's helpful. Um, but uh, super small, um, in the table that says daytime uh, parking, I think it would just be helpful to call it daytime only uh, parking. Uh, just to help clarify that it is yeah, still because, not okay to park there. Um, correct. After, or it's, it becomes alternating at night. 
Correct. Right. And I think that that is a, an important distinction that we need to make um, in the flyer and in other places that um, that you know it at after 10 p.m. you need to be on the correct side um, so that we can when we get in there at 4 a.m. in the morning we can clear to the curb line and do what we need to do prior to the downtown reopening. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one more question, but I'm actually going to save it and see what other thoughts. Uh, Lauren. Um, I have a few little uh, more like typo-y things that I can email to everyone in a second. Um, uh, but one question, I mean, I, I think it's a, so, somewhat clarifying just getting some language in here, um, places where like the even only park parking um, streets, it's also just even only days, um, just being really clear. I'm, I'm assuming that's correct, right, Zach? Um, uh, so it is on those streets for even and odd, it's all of the time. Uh, so we're asking people to move to the other side of the road between five and 10. So during that window, people could theoretically be parked on both sides of the street if it was allowed during that time. Um, but at that point, then at, by 10 p.m., they need to be on the correct side of the street. But, but for an odd only street, then they can park on odd days on that street on the odd side, but on an even day, there's no parking on that street. Is so that that's something that we need to kind of have a, a little bit of a discussion about. Uh, there's places that uh, I'm not sure that um, that will fully work. Um, Berlin Hill being one of them. I know that there's a lot of residents. We can't just put people on the other side of the street. Um, so I could kind of go either way on this, but I had a feeling that it would be an exemption, a full exemption to the rule where we would allow it all of the time. Um, and that would mean that uh, if we needed to clear there, we would have to post for no parking. But that's why we're trying to keep this list smaller so that if the amount of streets that we actually have to physically go out and put the no parking signs is um, very few. Okay. so. I might look at just the ordinance language again to make sure that that's clear if that's the um the way it's going to work you need to add another <laughs> you can make it works so people have more parking options um just a couple <clears throat> other questions um i guess one just can you remind us what the signage will be like just knowing that there's a lot of streets where there isn't necessarily a building nearby with a street number that's easily visible um and I know you had mentioned uh, last time that there's, you know, a lot of signposts and things you can just use, um, but can you just speak a little more to what the signage will be like to make so people know? Yeah, that, so that um, I would, I've done a little bit of research uh, looking at other communities and other communities have uh, simply kind of passed this and not really changed signage at all. Um, with that being said, I don't think that that is necessarily a great idea for us in Montpelier. Um, so what we're looking at is the alternating list and putting up a sign underneath it saying like alternate side parking, even side, um, or something of that nature. Um, so that people understand where, where on the street it begins and that they're allowed to do the alternating side there. Um, and I think for the majority of our streets, if you posted them on at intersections, I think that that would work uh, fairly well. Um, I'm thinking of like Barry Street, if you said alternate side, even side parking begins here and then ends here uh, type thing, that that would be sufficient. Thanks. I think my only other question, which, sorry, these are super nitpicky. Um, when you have the intersection as describing the start, like, is it always clear? Is it like the where the street starts? Is it where it ends? Is, it, is there going to be any confusion? Or I mean, I assume there'll be, you know, a good adjustment period this year as we figure yeah. this out. It's going to be like strict enforcement at these, but just just so people know what, you know, if, if in front of their house is going to be part of it or not. Um, so I, I think it, it would be important to include the state statute of how far people should be parking regardless away from the intersection, which I believe is like 20 feet. Um, so I think that we, I know that last year we had a lot of instances where we were working with residents and with PD for to try to correct some of those behaviors because people are parking like right up next to a stop sign and um, making it problematic to begin with. 
Um, so I, I think if we kind of reinforce what people should be doing naturally anyways, um, that that will help clarify when these zones start and stop um, at the intersections. Thanks. Other comments, questions? Jack, go ahead. All right, just a couple. I like, <clears throat> I like this idea in general, the idea of uh, making, uh, you know, saving uh, the overtime, making things, reducing the burden on the workers and improving safety for workers, I think are all very good. Um, a couple of detailed things. Do we think we'll be able to get the flyer into the, uh, the next uh, water bills? Is that what your plan was? Yeah, so we will have the opportunity basically to put whatever information with the water sewer bills, uh, we can have up to one page. So if that's the flyer, then that's fine. If we wanted to have a little bit of a more informational pamphlet, that's fine, but we're limited to basically one additional uh, attachment. Um, so it would probably be the flyer, but we may wanna include a little bit more information uh, on there, um, which I haven't quite worked out those logistics yet. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's uh, nice and graphic. I like that more information would probably be a good thing. And I would also encourage you to put a phone number and uh, and a web page uh, link on there so that you can hear from people. Absolutely. Uh, phone number, web page. OK. Thanks. OK. Um, I see you, Donna. And then Heather, did you want to? Um... Uh, address uh, th this issue? Okay, so we'll go Donna and then Heather. Mine's real short. You know you have two sides to that one sheet. So think about the other side of your paper. Yeah, so I think that includes the, the front side where the bill is on. Uh, we're only, I believe we've already accounted for that. Oh, I uh, thought you were inserting a whole new sheet of paper. No, oh, it's too bad. If we can, we will. And then we'll have both front and back, which would make it a lot easier. But uh, i got to make sure that we don't have anything else included. And there's some sure. other No, no. Yeah, right. It's just that it would help spacing out some of the words. So when people read it, you know, people are so short of patience reading flyers. So if you can give them a second page and and re-say things, spread it out. It, it's easier to read and remember. Thank you. That's, that's a great idea. If we can do that, well, we will. Yeah, really good work. Really appreciate it. OK, uh, Heather, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, I just had a few questions. So you said this is the, the first reading. So in other words, there's not a vote happening tonight the only vote that would happen tonight is probably to put on a, a second reading or unless we were gonna i don't think we were gonna skip that um so okay. yeah uh yeah i agree uh with lauren that i think the signs will be really important and you know i'm sure that there's probably a lot going on and signs might not be able to get up as soon as the proposed ban starts, but I have a feeling a lot of people in the city would, would like more specific signage up that's permanent. Um, are the tables available on the Facebook page? Uh, um, they can be. They certainly can be. Uh, we can have them posted. Uh... Probably, uh, well, um, by the end of the week, our, it's our secretary's um, birthday tomorrow, so she's not in. Uh, but by the end of the week, we can put them up there. Okay. And it sounds like um, you guys are still ironing things out in regards to the odd and even streets, like streets that only have odd and even. Um, Last year, there was the discussion about turning some streets into no winter parking, and Sibley Ave was one of them. Yes. So I saw on the Facebook page that it said some streets may be too narrow and would accommodate overnight parking. 
but then I was confused when those streets would be plowed. So I let's just talk Sibley because I think that's the one that you're referencing uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so the section between Barry and College, this, the section that we discussed last year um, during um, during the winter months, um, that would be between Barry and College. It would be even only, so you would be able to park um, between Barry and College on the even side of the street uh, on even calendar days, and then on from College to Sabin. Um, it has both sides. So we would allow odd parking uh, on the uh, on the odd side of the road above College Street. Um, and that is really uh, was to address some of the resident residential concerns that you yourself and others voiced. Um, so that's we looked at some of these areas that might be a little bit trickier and tried to make sure that we had reasonable accommodations for the residents living in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, um, thanks for the clarification. I do want to say I think it's a really good idea. And um, I agree that I think uh, this proposed plan would make plowing a lot more efficient. And um, I think it will be a little confusing at first, but I think it's a good idea. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Um, other, actually, I kind of want to jump in um, on that with, um, you know, with a with a question about posting the 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 tables. Um, I don't know if if this is too much work. Like no, that's perfectly fine. But I'm I could also picture having a map that's like maybe color coded that has like you know. So you can just look up your street um, that way um, as well for those who might find that easier. If that's too much, you know, like fair enough, but <laughs> just in terms of communicating that that might be a useful tool. Uh, I, and that is absolutely fine. And if you actually look here, uh, we have, so we did a draft map that goes oh, on the table. Yeah. Um, so we have already gone through and, and done that. Uh, the what We just haven't quite made it public viewing yet. Um, we are going to, I have a, a hard copy here. We are gonna put it in City Hall uh, so that people can stop by and look at it. Um, and uh, if if anyone had specific uh, like areas of concern, we could take a snapshot and send them, have a discussion like on a one-on-one -on -one basis to address a specific area. Okay, um, and then, I'm going to tag on one more thing here and then we'll go back to um, uh, other comments. Uh, sort of thinking about the map, uh, I, again, this, this is like, if this is too much work, then that's, you know, that's fair. But um, I'm just thinking about places where, like, as we transition from the last uh, configuration of winter parking, uh, where there were, no, um, you know, there were some places that no parking was allowed ever. Um, I assume all of those places are on this list as well. And I guess I'm wondering about like, are there, would there be places that show up differently in, in, in a negative way? And it sounds like there are some places where, you know, we had to ban it because it was too narrow, but too narrow in the last scheme, but but maybe we could do alternate side and that'd be okay. So that's actually like broadening, um, you know, the available parking, but is, did any go the other direction? Does that make sense? There were, there were a few and that's why we're kind of leaving it open for discussion. Like Wheelock street is a super steep grade. Um, I naturally just don't see much use of people parking there. I have come by early in the morning and seen one car parked on the street. So we may have a specific issue with that resident uh, towards the bottom of the hill. Uh, but there were a few that we put in there because it, it seemed to make the most sense. Um, there wasn't a clarifying ordinance one way or another. Um, but on areas like Phelps and Wheelock, we put them as no parking and we could have a discussion if there is um, I mean, we we could end up doing something with alternate side parking there, uh, but you know, if we if it's slippery and we're coming down the hill, then you know, it it would be better for cars to be off the road. Um, but with that being said, I'm, we're not against um, having the discussion on some of these streets. Okay. Um, 
Um, I wonder, I mean, I, particularly for those streets, especially if there's not very many of them, I do actually wonder if uh, we should send out some kind of notification to them to let them know that that's of the change. See, yeah, so some of the hard thing is that there was not any ordinance language written on oh, okay. streets. So because there's never been an issue, they weren't mm -hmm. included one way or the other, right? Uh, okay, so okay. From the band to where we were in the last couple of years, there is no reference for a lot of these streets. So this, we're, develop, we're now developing the first spot within. Because historically, everything has been done really on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. it, stuff in our ordinance just gets added and it not, so we're kind of looking to overhaul everything and to clean it up so that it's consistent. I, I mean, you'll notice in areas where we have um, residential parking programs uh, along the First Avenue, uh, Ridge Street, West Street. Um, so those we are going to propose for alternating, uh, but it, there's just been a lot of trying to, to clean things up and trying to make it consistent uh, so that um, it's not it's not so um, it, it's hard to follow the ordinance. And I read the ordinance several times, and I find it a little bit hard. Uh, because you have to look in multiple sections. You have a nighttime restriction for the winter. You have uh, restricted all the time. You have uh, your residential parking program. So we're trying to kind of retweak and clean everything up in the same process. Fair enough. Um, with that being said, we could just go through the ordinance and you know identify which ones, highlight them, which ones are changing from how it was written to where we are and we can start with developing that list first and see how many it is and how, how much um, manual notices that would take i think that would be helpful again if it's yeah i think it would be helpful can you take it book any more public comment absolutely stephen go ahead yeah uh it's unclear I, I think uh, Lauren made the point. Some sections are, it's not clear which, there's no street uh, numbers on some of the buildings. So that, and is this a nighttime only issue or is this going to be daytime for maintenance as well? It's all the time. Um, with the it's all the time. So, of the, the so, area, uh, which is a different exception rule, uh, but all of the other streets, it will be all of the time. So even if there's no snow on the ground or no snow to be cleaned up, we're going to forfeit that many parking places? So there, almost every day, I think there was two days of last winter between November 15th and April 1st when we were not doing winter operations related events, which is sanding, salting, clearing snow, pushing back. Um, even if it doesn't seem like it's snowing or does not seem intuitive, we are most likely out there doing work cleaning storm drains. Um, if you all remember last year or two years ago, we had the bad water break and our, st our storm drains weren't uh, cleaned and it made a mess of our downtown. Um, those are the type of things that uh, with the availability of being able to actually get to the curb line and uh, have those spaces available um, that we would be able to accomplish. Yeah, I, I just want to push back on that to the council that this is, this seems like a gross over, overreach because we know that we're short staffed and that those storm drains go months without being cleaned and the ice I've I've had to call public works regularly because the ice stays on well past the time many people have fallen so you know to basically pretend that by eliminating a lot of parking, public works is automatically going to step up and start doing all this stuff is fallacy. So especially school street specifically, there's, you know, we're going to forfeit 30 places, uh, you know, in one of the most congested and convenient parking areas uh, when there's no snow on the ground just seems uh, absurd. Uh, second, you know, it, we've got a lot of visitors coming to town who don't know the, the rules and if they're not clearly marked they're going to violate it and you know unless you're going to bag the meters on the sides that you know are are not 
ban, uh, that's going to be a problem. And then secondly, as far as the notification, I mentioned this last time, I think you should look at some large posters trying, once you figure out how to explain it, and we're not there yet, uh, some large posters, you could probably negotiate with city center to put them in the old La Brioche windows where people can see them, put them outside the front city hall portico where they're covered on a weighted easel, but where people don't have to go in and mingle in, in the, uh, the COVID zone. Uh, so my, my point is that this is going to take a whole lot of education. I've raised the red flag of the issues I, I'm opposed to, uh, and I hope you'll give it more thorough consideration. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, all right. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Uh, Connor, go ahead. I mean, I, I'm happy to make a motion, but uh, you know, I just want to say I think this is a really creative solution, and I appreciate our staff thinking outside the box on this so much. Um, you know, and we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't say we we've got probably pretty tough times ahead uh, fiscally here. So if this can save some overtime, that's important, but also the quality of life for our DPW workers here. Um, again, I think we'll uh, unfortunately be facing more water breaks that type of thing. Uh, so to have them devoted to those projects, I, I, I think that's a good thing and people will get used to it. So um, unless there's much other discussion, I, I would move that we go to second reading on this. And I see Lauren just sent us some changes that hopefully we can incorporate before the next reading. I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second, but I do want to check any, any other thoughts, comments, including from the public? Uh, Lauren. Um. I would just uh, say I think what I what I sent and um, are just really nothing that changes any meaning in the ordinance. It was just a couple kind of phrases. I think just clarifies a little bit more. Um, I do think if we need to figure out the odd even and if if we're going to, I think it needs some clarifying language in the ordinance. Um, if we're saying that on the odd only streets that you can park all the time and that even only you can park all the time, or if we're saying that it follows the rule, because the way I would read it, it's either confusing or I would think that if it's an odd only, that it's only odd calendar days, because that's what it says earlier in the ordinance. So I just, I think we need to clarify that um, in our own minds and in the ordinance language. <laughs> and I mean, I, I like the idea, if we can make it work that people could park there all the time. I mean, the more parking, the better. It seems like it creates potential challenges with the street um, plowing and stuff. So I don't know how that would work, but um, if we can do it, great. But if we need to follow the way the rest of the streets are gonna be, I, that would be understandable. Um, I did, uh, Don and I were talking earlier today. Um, I think that it's important that we write in some language about um, the ability to make changes. Um, if we're realizing that something is not happening, uh, allowing um, Bill to authorize a change to maybe take something off of a no parking list um, so that it, it does that we don't have to go back through all of this to get approval. Um, I think that that's important if we want to really look at being having a successful program we need the ability to uh, tweak it uh, if we need to. Um, one thought on that and then I see you Heather. Um, for some other ordinances, we have the ordinance just reference a table, which is not included in the ordinance language itself. Um, so I, I wonder if that's a possibility. Um, it would make it easier for it to be a little more flexible. But anyway, that's something you all can okay. work, determine. Uh, Heather. Uh, I apologize if you already said this, but <clears throat> like currently there's still those designated areas around town where overnight parking is available. Uh, for example, I think, you know, so the street on the, by the co-op. Stone cutters. Right. So let's say uh, certain streets were just too crowded to park there, there would still be still over parking lots, right? That is correct. Um, one of the things that we looked at is I, we did some counts about our parking lots and we can really only truly, the way that it's signed, accommodate 72 people to overnight park between 
the lot that we have behind City Hall and Stonecutters. Uh, having driven down Stonecutters during a storm, um, everyone parks there. Um, so I'm not sure that they're we're not overstepping the bounds into parking in to permit areas or the the Nature Conservancy or other areas. Um, we've only, I mean, we have that one specific spot on Stonecutters um, where we would sign for overnight, but we would still allow that. And the other thing that um, we are looking at is providing a, a long-term overnight parking at um, Poolside Drive up by the ball field. So if you ever got towed, um, your car was towed to the ball field road, um, to allow for people that don't have a driveway and that need long-term overnight parking, um, the thought is that you could go up to Poolside Drive and be able to park there so that if you're gone for a week during the winter, um, you're okay. You don't have to have someone come out and move your car. You don't have to worry about uh, any of those issues. Great, thank you. Mayor, can I make one more comment about the notification? Uh, I think it's unwieldy for uh, notifications to have to go into multiple venues. Uh, Facebook puts a paywall or a registration requirement. Uh, Front Porch Forum could be argued. I think creating a more usable city website and just making one destination where everybody finds this information is better in the long run because the information can be inconsistently interpreted or reposted on those other forums. Hmm. It's a good point about posting it on the city's website, and I assume we'll have that pretty prominently um, once it gets yep. together. We're gonna, if you've ever been onto our, our website, we do have a page for the winter parking ban. Um, we will be in the in the process of making a draft page uh, that will include comments and a log of any concerns that people have raised and providing a link to the map um, and some more information. We just it, it's been moving pretty fast, so we're, we're doing what we can to stay ahead. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and so this will be on our agenda for the, oh, actually, we're about to say a vote <laughs> on, on, uh, on that. I can't, can't say whether or not yet. Okay. So um, there's a motion and a second. Any further comments on this? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Hi. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, that motion passes. So we will be taking this up again um, for a second reading. Thank you for all of your work on this, uh, Zach and Donna. So grateful. Thank um, you. Thanks for having us. And we'll, yeah, absolutely. And we'll try to help push out the, the information ourselves as well. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. All right. So on to uh, a discussion about uh, follow up to the uh, policing uh, discussion that we had. Um, I can't remember if it was the last meeting or a couple of meetings ago, but um, all right. So for this, I am going to turn it over to uh, Bill or the chief. I'll start, but I see the chief is here. Um, so. Two meetings ago, the, the chief outlined you know, his thoughts and his memo about the department and the council gave general approval to the plan to move forward, but one of it in, in involved, a uh, specific request involved the creation of a committee to look at, uh, you know, the chief specifically talked about for strategic planning for the committee, but I think there was desire to look at other things as well. And so we said we'd get back to you with a specific recommendation that you could work from. And so we've provided you a memo with that. Um, also at that meeting where, uh, you know, the group has been active and I see a couple of them here presented 11 uh, requests or demands. So we provided um, our responses or thoughts on those. Uh, clearly, obviously the, the most substantive one is, is how we're gonna handle the budget and that's still a month or two away, but uh, certainly the biggest impact. Um, I did want to talk quickly about the very first one about the school resource officer because that has, sort of pushed to the head of the class. Um, as, as many of you may be aware, the, the school board last week voted to temporarily suspend the activities of the school resource officer while they formed a committee to take a look at actions. Um, there seems, in communication with school officials, there's, there's a couple of issues. One, uh, there's not complete clarity that that was intended to in, in include the city. Um, 
I think some people felt it was and some it wasn't. So I think it would be helpful if the city tonight, if we made some sort of motion to formally request that the city government be involved in, in this process so that it's on record that we, we think that because we're partners in, in this uh, situation uh, that that we'd be at the table. Um, and obviously we would provide whatever information was necessary for that process at, at any rate. Uh, and secondly, just uh, so that the council's aware, there's been communication between the chief and the superintendent and the school board, uh, uh, just about clarification of actual roles. Um, and so you, you may hear about that, but I think just to make clear what, what the expectations are and aren't for response uh, and that what, what, these decisions mean so that there's so that if something does occur or, or a situation comes up if it's been thought about in advance as opposed to you know why were the police there and why weren't they there uh, etc so that sort of interim conversation is going forward but so um, otherwise i think that that first issue the sro issue is really um, being led by oh and one last thing on that so in addition to the um school forming a committee and Probably, you know, I'd advise you to, to if, if you wish, to be involved, to make a, a vote to to a, a formal request, and I can draft that for you. Um, the plan that had been discussed with between the superintendent and I and the mayor and the chair of the school board um, prior to last week's vote was there would be a joint committee and that we would get an outside um, facilitator uh, so that was a more neutral party operating the meeting so that all people with all voices felt um, safe and that nobody was trying to drive an agenda. So we reached out to the group, uh, Creative Discourses, who is already, we've already hired to do our diversity work here in, for the city uh, from the Social Justice Committee. They've provide, provided a proposal to uh, the school and to us, and, and the plan was that we would spit it, uh, spit it, split it, the cost financially if uh, since we split the officer and we would be joint partners on this and uh, our share would only be $2,400 that's within you know so I told them we were okay with that since that's within my dollar limit um, but making sure that you've all heard that and if you have concerns about that uh, again some school board members may want to not have the city involved, in which case I assume the school would then assume the full cost, but uh, that's to be worked out. At this point, I think the assumption is we're going to be collaborating and cooperating, working together, hiring, uh, sharing the neutral facilitator, and that uh, um, folks from this council would have a seat uh, on that committee table. And when I talk about city officials, I'm talking about you, the elected officials, not me, not the chief, not anyone like that. So that's the overview. Happy to obviously talk about any of these issues. So I actually wonder if we should take up the uh, SRO question um, actually first um, and then move on to talking about uh, the other, like the um, proposed strategic planning com uh, committee. Um, so how, so taking this in two separate parts, um, how do you all feel about requesting to participate on that task force? Um, so I see, uh, oh, I see some thumbs up, <laughs> but I also see Dan and Lauren. We'll, we'll go in that order. Okay, um, I, I would support being a part and making a motion to that extent. I think in part, and I listened to um, a substantial part of that school board discussion last week, um, it seemed as if a lot of the discussion involved some assumptions as to how um, some of the functions of the SRO would would act going forward, which I think necessarily implicates us as a city as well. You know, the future of the SRO, whatever shape or form it would take, because it is a partnership. Um, you know, we it, I think our input's pretty critical to this process. Um, and, you know, we have a role and need to provide input at the table with this, with this conversation. So I would, I'd fully and strongly support that. And I, you know, I think it makes sense, you know, it's each board can come to their own conclusions, um, or a joint conclusion 
but I, I think the process has to be shared and there has to be a shared conversation about it. Um, so I would strongly support that. And that's just my point. Great. Thank you. Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I would I would echo that. Also um, listened to the most recent school board meeting and there were, you know, I think policy implications and also potential budget implications for the city. So having us be, you know, at the at the table and, um, you know, there were also discussions that seems, you know, I think the way they even worded their resolution was, you know, the kind of policing in and near the schools, which seems like pretty encompassing and, you know, gets into um, city functioning as well. So I think uh, just to bring that broader perspective um, would be really valuable to the process um, and also kind of keeping uh, good communication with the, the rest of the conversation we'll have tonight of the, um, you know, the, the broader conversation that we're having as a community around policing and how the SRO does and doesn't fit within that, um, I think would be valuable to just keep good communication and collaboration um, and I'll be at the table together. So I'd also support a motion to that effect. Great. And then did I see Jay? And then yeah. Connor. Yeah, sorry, quickly, I'll just add to, you know, support Lauren and Dan's comments. Um, uh, you know, watching the, um, the school board meeting from last week and seeing the resolution and how broad it was and um, as much as, you, you know, they passed the resolution knowing that they need to form this committee but didn't necessarily provide any specific guidance in terms of who was going to be involved, um, but seeing the obvious implications to, to the city um, uh, and that it makes uh, yeah, I fully support a motion that we would um, want to have a you know place at that table and and be a part of it because it's um, yeah as Lauren said it goes you know it, as the resolution that they pass it goes even beyond um, you know just the community around the schools etc. So thank you. Great, uh, Connor. Oh yeah, just a question: Is the thought? And I, I'm sorry, I didn't see the school board meeting. Is the thought that this would be resolved within the current fiscal year, or you would gather the information you need to make a decision for the following fiscal year? I think that's I, I think that's uncertain from the schools. Um, you know, presumably the city and school need to make a decision about any number of these budget issues by say November, December-ish, as as we pick prayer, and so, uh, and that would be for the next fiscal year. So, you know, it would seem that if there's a, if there's a decision where we're going to not have the SRO, for example, then both the city and school would know that in time to prepare their budgets accordingly. Conversely, if the decision is to, to go forward with it, then it would be, you know, in time to have in the budgets. Uh, so, you know, maybe we could have preliminary budgets prepared in December and the final decision not made till January, but I think both, both the city and school would have to decide before their budgets are put to a vote what was included for next year. This is my assumption only, nobody said this, but I would presume since both the city and school have budgeted for it in this present year, that if the decision is made to go forward in the future, that it would continue then, it would take up during this year as well from that point forward. Um, but that's just my thought of that. That's not based on anybody else's statement or comment. Um, Donna and then Lauren. I just had a question about the suspension. Does this impact the officer involved in any way? Uh, is he or she reassigned duties? Does so, yeah, so the officer, um, SRO, Diane Matthews, uh, is continuing to work on patrol and working with homeless and doing other things. Um, but basically there were specific school resource officer functions that the school said, you know, we um, would rather not have happen while we're sorting this out, but they, that left a lot of unanswered questions. And so in addition to this committee, we're trying to sort out um, what, what that means. You know, if we're called to the campus, what does that look like? Because one of the concerns was officers in uniform, um, but if there's no SRO who would be in more casual dress, then the only people that would respond to campus would be, any campus would be officers in uniform. And what if 
a third party calls. It's not a school official if somebody right. witnesses something on a school. You know, so, so there's just a lot of practical questions and we're not trying to create problems. We just want to make sure there's clarity. Um, the SRO has handled truancy issues, you know, getting a, a truant student. Is that something they still want the police to do? Uh, even things as simple as some of the officers drop off and pick up children, their own children at school in uniform. Uh, you know, it's, our assumption is they can still do that like any other parent, but is, you know, that ought to be clear. So, um, well, part, part of my asking was for the person, but also was I felt like in the motion, maybe we need to push. I feel it's very time sensitive for this year. I mean, a committee can go a long time before making decisions. And I didn't get a sense from the school board. They put any time limits on it. Did I miss it? So I, I would like us to maybe push it to say that we'd like to have this resolved. Um, soon and then some time limit maybe you and brian can make some suggestions on time jay did you have an answer to that well well my understanding is that um you know part of the the um, school board's um thought around paying and as, as bill mentioned paying somebody to facilitate this process and to and to engage the community is to not necessarily sort of punt it to the next fiscal year as a, as a question that happens as we're putting our budgets together, but rather something that can be resolved by the end of the 2020 calendar year so that we can move, so that the school district can move into the second semester as it were and starting in January with a plan of what exactly the role of the SRO would be. Um, so and then of course yeah there's so there's that short term looking at the you know the calendar the school's calendar year but then also thinking about what the budget implications are for our next next fiscal year but but looking to you know get this resolved you know in a way that still allows for appropriate community engagement but can get us all to a point where we can make a decision to finish the school year and then move on from there hope that helps okay. Yeah. And I think part of the idea with of having outside facilitation is that, you know, the conversation at school board meetings and at city council meetings is great, but we, we also have other agenda items. And so if the community can have a couple of focused meetings of, you know, two or three hours where they can really focus on this issue and all voices can be heard and listened to and, um, you know, we can maybe focus on the things we have in common and the goals we're trying to accomplish and then talk about the best ways for those to happen. Um, that's, that's the goal, you know, we're open to any kind of conversation. It's just, I think it's important that people get to weigh in. I mean, we've heard a lot of voices that have a lot of concerns and those need to be aired and vetted and, and taken seriously. So, um, we, we, you know, appropriate time by both boards needs to be given. And so rather than, I think the, the initial thought that, that the mayor and I had with the school board chair and the superintendent was rather than city council embarking on a process to hear all these voices in the school board embarking on a process that since we share this position, it made more sense to have the process together and have everybody hear the same comments at the same time and work it through together. And well, Lauren, did you have something? And then Donna, yeah. Um, just, I mean, it came up a little while ago now, but um, just for clarity for those who uh, did not um, have a chance to listen to the school board meeting. So they did make clear that they were going to follow through on the financial commitment for this fiscal year. They said, you know, voters approved the city and the school board budget. I mean, that was kind of the conversation went a little um, all over the place, but then they did land there. So it it was looking at budget implications for the next fiscal year. Um, and, you know, I think it became clear and I think kind of feeds into the broader discussion we're going to have have soon but you know there's if they're going to change the system you have to you know the this process looking at well what systems have we put in place and we can't just take them away without anything to um to do instead we need to you know build other systems and so i think you know the the timeline i think will partly depend on how quickly could you get other things in place if you did want to transition to other models for certain aspects of um, what services are currently being provided by the school resource officer. So that was my interpretation of the conversation um, so for what it's worth. Okay, oh, Donna. Just a short question about, Bill, do we, we have funds 
sort of loose hanging around to pay our share of facilitator. I presume if we're wanting to be partners, we are paying. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't, right. We, we're, we don't have money for anything. Um, I mean, honestly, right. We're, we're in a bad situation, but this is a really high priority issue for the community. And I think there are a lot of, um, pained voices that are that are communicating and speaking out and they need to be heard and they need to be done the right way. Um, I think community trust is really important. So I think if the school board were running this or the city, there'd be a concern that somehow we were driving at an agenda or, or whatever that, that we had arranged the process. So we've reached out to a group that does work like this and asked them to design a process. Uh, and we would support and, and our share is, is $2,400. It's not exorbitant. Um, uh, you know, obviously if you all tell me you don't want to spend that money on this process, I, I won't, but that, that falls within my approval level. And to me, that seemed like something that, that was worth taking a chance on and, um, you know, investing the money in for um, the sake of the community. Thank you. Great. Uh, Connor. Yeah, another just quick question. Do we know is the community justice center at the table on this? Because I thought like maybe one thing on the side of keeping the officer was that bridge with the CJC and coming up with like alternative methods of discipline that, you know, that didn't entail like, you know, putting somebody in a car or something, you know? So uh, they have asked to be, and I think they probably would be a part of it as this group meets. I, I want to, so you actually said a couple of words that I think are really important. Number one is that the school resource officer is not involved in discipline. Uh, school makes its own decisions about that. Um, and so they, you know, that's, so that I, I want to be clear about that. Um, the only, no one would be taken away in a car unless they committed a serious crime and it, it couldn't be handled in other ways. Number two, the schools have adopted the restorative model for dealing with students uh, in crisis or in situations. And the, the, the Justice Center helps has helped train the school and help facilitate that. And on occasion has, has taken referrals when they would be out of the school. One of the reasons, frankly, that we didn't ask the Justice Center, we talked about the Justice Center to lead this effort was they are an arm of the city government. And even though they do what they do and they do it really well, again, and we just felt it was given people's um, comments that it was really important that it not be led by the city or a school, an agency of the city or the school. Great. Um, Adam, are you going to take public comment on this section? Yes, we will. Um, go ahead, Stephen, and then Lauren, go ahead. So uh, I think you should exercise real caution. Well, I don't uh, oppose the idea of uh, a kind of a collaborative uh, issues uh, process. It's also very possible for the city to be intruding into the school board's domain here with a heavy hand. And I think to the degree that it's just like if Barry took issue with us on CVPSA, they don't come in and insert themselves into your city council meetings. The school board is its own elected body. And to the degree the city wants to get involved, it needs to do so very lightly with by invitation and not by, you know, insertion. Uh, so I just want to caution that, that there's a likelihood, the sophistication of manipulation that goes on within our city government doesn't need to be imposed upon the school. Secondly, the caution about the school resource officer who has lied on official papers multiple times and and misrepresented statutes. And so I have real concerns about the character, which I've called to the attention of the chief and gotten no response. So in the net latter half of this section, I want to strictly, you know, advocate for the, the, uh, oversight body with subpoena power that can really investigate, uh, not, not an advisory strategic planning, you know, we'll tell you what we want to hear, but an oversight commission. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lauren. So I was just going to uh, to say that um, hiring creative discourse seems like a great move. Um, 
you know, we're already hiring them, as Bill mentioned, for the social and economic justice advisory committee process. So this feels like a good way of kind of building some community relationships and kind of it can, I think, feed into and help bolster even further that work that we're already investing in. So at least I like the idea of if we're going to have to spend some money that's so hard to come by right now that um, in some ways I think I can make that process even better with some of the groundwork that it can help lay in the community. Yeah. And just, just a point yeah. actually that Steve Whitaker just raised. Um, you know, I think we preface this by saying we would we we're seeking a vote to request that the city be included in a joint committee that, that we are that we are specifically not seeking to go to school board meetings and participate in their meetings. We are seeking to form a joint committee with them to work independently, uh, collaboratively. So I, I do appreciate the point that we're not trying to muscle in on, on school board. Uh, Dan. Right. And I guess I'll just pick, pick up that thread as well. I mean, you know, this is this is a place where there is overlap. This is a city employee who has a contract with the school board to perform functions within the schools. Um, and so it necessarily you know, Im implicates the city. Um, and given that the discussion, as Lauren pointed out, has has ranged well beyond um, so the four walls of the school to the schoolyard to even outside in the street. I think this is, again, this is just an important um, issue in which we're not looking to substitute our judgment or impose our judgment on the school board. They're a duly elected body. They make their own decisions, but in part so that we understand um, and there's some joint process because of the overlap in some of these issues. So it's, to me, this is just something that, that makes basic sense and obviously we're not approaching this as a um you must do this but um that we expect we would we would strongly in, uh, encourage participation uh with the city because of the importance uh and because we take this seriously Yeah, and I guess I would also just add to that um, that one of my hopes for this committee, um, in addition to um, just digging into thinking about specifically the the, the SRO, is also you know, that they whoever's on this committee will uh, become experts on this, and that requires uh, taking some time to under to understand so that everyone's working from the same facts. Um, so I just want to put that out there too. Uh, all right. So I don't think we have a motion on this. Do we have a motion on this? I'll, I'll make a motion that we, um, direct, uh, or let me phrase it this way. I, I make a motion that we make a request to the school board that the city be included, uh, the city officers be included. Um, in any joint committee that is formed uh, to discuss the future of the student uh, school resource officer in Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. Second. Okay. Any further discussion about that, including from the public? Okay. Um, all right. So, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you for that. And we'll, um, we'll see how that goes. All right. So moving on to, uh, the follow up from the, uh, policing discussion a couple meetings ago. Um, one of the, uh, proposals was to form a, um, strategic planning, uh, advisory committee. Uh, board and so for this um, either um, uh, Bill or Brian would you like to say anything further about this particular part or um, we can also just start getting into questions if you if there's nothing more to add I really don't have anything to add we this is you know we described this broadly or the chief described this broadly uh, at that August 26 meeting and we, we put some specifics to it and some thought about what it would include um, yeah. To the point that Mr. Whitaker raised, um, you know, we, our 
our form of government doesn't allow for subpoenas necessarily. We have elected uh, state's attorney, elected attorney general who can perform that role. Um, our governance creates the city council as the oversight board for all city government, city managers operating. So we tried to create a structure that respected the form of government, but also provided constant information and public discussion about the issues that were involved. So I, for, I think it probably makes sense to um, talk about this generally, and um, and then we can get into more specifics. So, uh, general thoughts on this proposal, uh, Dan, go ahead. Um, well, I think one of the things that I'd like to see uh, on this committee or subcommittee, whatever we would dub it, um, would be a little bit of a deeper dive um, than necessarily is what what is proposed. In part, it seems like a lot of the discussion that we've been having as a community, um, particularly at these these city council meetings, um, but I think in a larger context in the, the larger community is a, is a question about, you know, what are the roles of uh, the police department? What are the uh, current trends and future directions? And I, I think Chief Pete did a great job in his report, um, but I... I think one of the reasons at least I was motivated to um, propose, to think about and support the proposal of this committee was to look at, have a group of people, as you said, Mayor, about the SRO, to do a deeper dive and educate themselves and become, you know, start to become subject matter experts about these, these issues um, as a way of building uh, an understanding in the community, um, which is, you know, that's the, I, I don't want to say the downside, but that's one of the functions of a, uh, you know, professional driven city government is that average citizens may not have necessarily the full understanding of some of the more technical features of any given department. I certainly, you know, wouldn't know where to begin in, in some of public works if, if we were discussing that, um, other than to, you know, say those are great plows. Um, but I think, you know, in, when we talk about policing um, and we talk about 21st century policing and we talk about some of these community policing concepts, um, they can be a bit abstract or they can be um, a bit dense, I think, for us as city councilors, but certainly the larger community. So I'd like to see, you know, at, at the very least, um, one of the charges of this committee to be to looking into some of these deeper issues. And that may be embedded in the idea of helping to build the strategic plan. Um, but I think it needs to be explicit that this would be, this would be a subcommittee that looks to, you know, become um, more versed in some of these, some of these issues, some of these topics, some of these trends, some of these data points um, that we can then use as a resource as a city council. Um, and, and the community to use as a resource as well. So that's those are my initial thoughts, and I'll stop there, but I have more to say. Fair enough. Other thoughts uh, generally? Also, I, I think it's uh, a great idea to consider that we need to, you know, with the forming of this group, that sort of step zero is getting ourselves educated. Um, or whoever's on that committee, um, and and taking a, a, a deep a deep dive. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, other thoughts, uh, Connor, go ahead. I, I was just a bit unclear yeah. if, if the committee has like so, sort of a thought that it's like a start and an end date where specific recommendations would be brought to council, and you, you would expect that they'd be acted upon, or whether this would be an ongoing committee that goes years into the future because I you know I think like you know if you're going to commit to serving on it right that's a it's a horse of a different color there so um yeah just uh we would have waited All right, I can tell you we we talked about this and, I, and maybe you know we didn't want to complicate things right so we didn't want to create like two different committees and you know so I think that the idea is and you know you could end up transitioning people along the way so so let me answer let me, I've said stuff without answering your question. The idea is it would be an ongoing committee that, but that its initial work in, in I don't think, I don't want to speak to the chief, but I don't think we have any objections to a deep dive. And I, I think that is what, you know, when we talked about a strategic plan, it means how will we strategically address these things? So um, if you want to 
add those kind of words to it, that's I, that's in sync with what we were thinking. So I thought it was we'd be doing that kind of stuff first. Um, you know, maybe taking a hard look at, at the policies that are already in place, taking a look at the 21st century policing, all those things that we talked about. That that and so that that may come out with some recommendations to the council that says here's here's how we see the department moving forward in the future. But it, similarly, there ought to be a group that is, you know, I mean, we provide all this information to the public, we provide it all to you, but there ought to be a group that's maybe, you know, looking, we suggested quarterly, but I mean, as much as you want, at, at things like crime statistics, at things like use of force reports, at things like incidents, the things, you know, we listed some of those things. So that in addition to planning, it's kind of a how, are, how is the department doing and, and what what are the key trends that we see in the community? What how, how are things being addressed and, and providing a place for that conversation to occur on a regular basis? So it may be that there's a, a group of people that form, do some of the early work and then say, okay, you know, not time for some new members for the more regular ongoing reporting. But the idea is that, you know, if people really want transparency in policing, it needs to be a regular review of what's what's happening and a regular place to publicly talk about it with more time than just in a council meeting. Fair enough. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Um, my question, I at first initially thought it was a bit top heavy with three council members. Um, a discussion with Dan Richardson helped me uh, understand better perhaps the advantages, but then I'd want more stakeholders. I feel especially initially when we were de going deep for understanding that we need to share this knowledge and growth and opportunity to do some assessment with our stakeholders. So it says two to four, and I feel that's sort of wimpy. <laughs> uh, let me be clear. This is, if you choose to do this, whatever you add for the charge and however you form the committee is your committee. This is a, an outline that we provided. Um, so, you know, we can't tell you how to do this. Um, I, I think I, I understand think, that. I'm just from adding. My yeah. From my perspective, it was just more thinking about what makes for functional committees. So five to seven people are functional. You know, at what point does it become too large and unwieldy? But that's that's not my decision to make. That's yours. That's what I would add to it. I would just solidify more stakeholders. Madam Mayor, whenever you taking public comment. Um, sure, go ahead, Stephen, and then Jack, and then Lauren. Uh, so I, I think it's important to distinguish between a strategic planning educational committee and an accountability commission. There, that when when I have raised for, to you over many months or a year various issues of you know officers stealing unopened beers from homeless people, uh, prior issues with. Uh, internal affairs officer refusing to report to his superiors or to the council. You know, we've got, we had two shootings in as many years and this chief hasn't even seen fit to go through the whole file and see whether we've got a dangerous cop on our force. And I've called the issue of the SRO. Diane is, is, a, is a liar. So we can't let those things wait till this, you know, strategic planning commission may or may not end up with an, a recommendation to form a, a accountability commission there needs to be some real oversight here and if the city council wants to air it all out in public that's one way but i think you know i did hear jack mccullough you know last meeting or so uh speak similar thoughts about a, a accountability board an oversight board that can actually dig into this and take it seriously and do it sooner than later so i want to just reiterate that that's not what i hear going on here it looks like a deflection Okay, thank you. Yeah, interesting thoughts there. Um, Jack, do you, you wanted to go. Thanks. I don't consider my support for a process like this to be a deflection. I think that we've got, I, I agree with Bill's idea that this would be uh, a standing committee of some kind, it would uh, have ongoing functions. The, uh, the strategic planning, <clears throat> as I see it, naturally probably comes first because 
although I, I support some form of uh, civilian review and oversight and review of uses of force and uh, a lot of the things that I said last time and that we uh, that are talked about in the memo, I don't think the council is in a position to make a decision, sorry, <laughs> to make a decision for what uh, should happen tonight. And I think that the deliberations and investigation of this committee will be uh, part of the input to decide uh, what what the needs are, what uh, the possible uh, mechanisms are to provide the oversight that uh, that the community decides is needed. I'll yeah. trust your judgment on this one, Jack. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, Lauren, I think you are next. Uh, yeah, a few ahead. thoughts. Um, so, I mean, I also think that, you know, although it feels like, uh, you know, we can be ponderously slow in governmental decisions. Um, I mean, I, I think having this kind of um, group created is really important. I don't think it precludes at all creating other structures. And I think it's exactly as has come up several times, the kind of expertise and deeper dive to figure out what structure would make sense. I've read and heard really conflicting things about, you know, even citizen oversight panels that are created well or poorly and how they can function and well for a community. So I, you know, I think taking that lightly or trying to just, you know, jump into something without that um, really hard, thoughtful work. And that's the kind of thing that I think this group could really look into is what, you know, what structure, you know, is that a good idea for our community and what would it look like if so? Um, so I, I think this is a great idea. One thing I was wondering about, and I think it's something that potentially the group could maybe put thought into it first. And it, I think it goes into the strategic um, planning piece, but I know that, you know, we've certainly heard a range of perspectives, you know, here at city council, heard a lot of thoughts at the um, recent school board meeting on policing. I think there's, you know, a wide spectrum of perspectives on the future of policing for the community. So just thinking about what kind of, you know, shared goals that a group could come up with. And I don't know if at some point we as a council need to give more clarity to, you know, what the, what the vision of the city council is to give them more specificity. I mean, if you look at the, the charge that was proposed here, I think it could be information gathering and could, um, but I, you know, it might be tricky for them or people with different positions to know how they're bringing, um, bringing forward. I know, I know a lot of us will be on it so, so we could um, represent ourselves there, um, but, but just, you know, wanting to hone in potentially. Um, and again, I think the group could do that at early meetings of just more like what, what specifically are we trying to accomplish? What's, what are the shared vision and values underpinning this um, together? Um, really hope it's a, a process with a lot of public engagement and, you know, beyond just being open meetings, but really soliciting a lot of um, feedback and participation. Um, agree with Donna, we probably want, um, you know, a few more people, I think getting um, a, a breadth of perspectives would be helpful and people can either be members or maybe it's just actively soliciting participation for different issues. Um, and it talks about policy recommendations, wondering if we want to also be clear that that could include budget recommendations as well, if there were any budgetary implications, um, maybe that's implied, but just that seems like a big piece of what um, what could come out of it and hopefully that would you know this group could be looking both short-term recommendations and this longer-term vision and policy analysis um so that's my hope um so yeah i'll leave it there thank you other thoughts connor go ahead I mean, I, and then dan I, I will be interested in hearing some public comment here because we do have a group of people who have been coming you know to most council meetings um, and I've asked the question, I, I don't know if I've got an answer. Is it a formal group? You know, are these demands made by consensus? Are there point people to the group? Uh, are there folks we should be meeting with? Who can we contact? And, and I really would like to know um, from this group of folks, uh, is this something you're like willing to be a part of? 
Um, or do you see this as kind of like window dressing or the illusion of public input? Um, so, yeah, I think that like drives some of my decision making, um, what the folks who have been coming in here every week think. And if you're, if you're willing to participate in this, so not anything anybody on council can answer. Well, and um, with that, I might pause here a minute. Is there any, any other comments from the public on this? I've got a comment. It was, let me start the video. It was more so on some of the other items addressed in the memo, but um, since Connor had asked, I figured I'd chime on in. Um, I'm not sure. I do think people would be interested, but there is not a unified group. It, we are just uh, concerned community members. So I'm not sure at the moment, but it's definitely something I'm sure others might want to speak to. And um, maybe I'll make my comment later if you're going to address the um, other parts of the memo. Sure, let's let's take that separately. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks for that question, though. Um, okay, any other comments? I guess that answers your question, more or less, Connor. Or sort of, right? Um, okay, so Dan, go ahead. Um, well, just along not uh, Connor's point, but uh, back to sort of Lauren's point, you know, I, I think that this subcommittee, I guess I would give it about six things, and I've actually sort of wrote it out a little bit to think about some of these things. Um, you know, I think the charge, I, I think that the function of the committee is, uh, we're talking about two, two things, but it's not two mutually exclusive things. I think they build upon each other. And when we talk about the sort of deeper dig and, and education, that, that almost comes first, but it builds up sort of the second function, which is where the committee sees itself playing the best role um, going forward. And I think there is a tension, you know, between do we set this up as, an, as, a, as a resource for the city council in the city council playing an oversight role or does this does this subcommittee eventually take on some oversight functions uh, or review, um, or is it a mixture of the two? And I think that comes. I don't think anyone can necessarily answer that right now definitively. Um, and I think it builds out of you know these some of these initial conversations. And so, you know, I would see the six things that at least I would think for this committee would be to review the historic functions of the Montpelier Police Department. You know, where have we come from? And, and so this builds on what Chief Pete put into his memo, but, it, you know, sort of going off of that. Um, the other is to, as I said before, to review modern policing trends and practices, such as those embodied in the President's Task Force on 20, 21st Century Policing and other reference materials. Uh, and then the third part, which gets to the point that I think gets to Lauren's point, is I think we, I think we do have to reach out uh, or this committee would have to reach out to community stakeholders and you know i think we have to cast a fairly broad net on that not just not just members of the community individual residents but you know some of the law enforcement partners so the state's attorney's office but also the public defender's office and the crime victim advocates office and the washington county mental health the montpelier business community the montpelier social and economic justice community you know the, these kind of, of groups that are already established and and you know seeking some of their input on that and then the fourth thing i think is to review um you know to review the data that they've talked about about crime trends department activity race data complaint resolution major incidents um and analyze and provide you know some some um observations because i think you look at that data um, and it's it's very it, it, you can draw some very clear and powerful conclusions as we did last time, but it it would be nice to have this this committee be able to look deeper at some of that and look at it in the context of either the state or national, um, and then to review the functions and analyze the functions of the Montpelier Police Department uh, as part of its current strategic plan, existing policies, and going forward, um, and then. I would see at least as a first phase this coming to a report or some some type of goal where we we as a council would receive some of this the benefit of the work that we would expect the subcommittee to do um maybe not in the form of we recommend x y and z out of this but just simply 
the the fruit of this labor uh, and then and include in that you know so start to build some of the recommendations of where this committee would go forward from there so that that i guess is a little bit more expanded about where i think this subcommittee could go and what i would see is a deeper dive looking like yeah thank you those all sound good to me <laughs> um cool other thoughts on this if there's no thoughts um generally uh about this then oh thumbs up awesome um then um I think it might make sense to start talking about some specifics. It sounds like people are generally on board with the idea of creating um, this board or committee, whatever you want to call it. And so that leads me to a couple of, or like it's actually a series of questions. So one question is, uh, and, well, there's a, there's a number of ways to, to think about this. So one question would be how many city councilors either should be on it or are interested in being on it. I can attack that a couple of ways. Um, and then a second question is either um, how many um, other seats do we want to create for it? Um, and then all, all of that is sort of in the context of, you know, do we want to set some kind of a size limit? Um, on the group. And to be fair, if we are creating this, then we can adjust that number anytime. Uh, but, you know, it, it could be good to um, have a goal, uh, some kind of a goal there in, in mind. Um, and then beyond that, um, just to clarify the, the process. And so this is how I understand um, this, that this would go. If we do have other, you know, stakeholders that we want to, to be there. I'm thinking of this process as similar to when we set up the homelessness task force, where we said, you know, we'd really like to have a seat at the table there for someone from the business community. And we'd really like, you know, um, representation there from someone who has the experience of being homeless. And, um, and I think we, we probably want to do that um, here again. And I mean, in the end with the homelessness task force, we still put out a call and said, who's, who's out there that would like to participate. And then we, we made those appointments. Um, so unless someone has other ideas as to how of the other stakeholder piece would go, that's how I'm envisioning it. Any other bills that how you're envisioning that part going or, or chief. Yeah, but really, I, you know, we want to be careful not to be dictating who you put on you know, who you think is best to provide you the input that you need. But I I had in mind that similar model of the homeless okay. task force. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I, I think it's probably, when we get to the part of talking about stakeholders, I think it's worth um, having this consideration, um, too, that, that Dan brought up about um, the, the, some of the different parties that are involved. And it's worth considering the question, is, are, is this a, a person that is a stakeholder and should be a part of decision making the decision making process, or is this um, uh, the kind of position that we would want to invite in for some expertise, uh, though they're not necessarily a stakeholder? Um, so, just want to be thoughtful about that. So, I know I've said a whole bunch of things here. Um, I'm happy to start with either what do we think the total size should be, or how many counselors. Um, should be on this. I mean, the initial proposal was that we have one from each district. Um, yeah, what's, uh, anybody have thoughts on any of those um, pieces? Uh, go ahead, Connor. I, I mean, I'll just throw it out there. I think three is probably at least one too many counselors on this. You know, if we want this to be a process where you know we, we think we're engaging all the stakeholders it's pretty close to a quorum three there and i i, I don't know if that might give the wrong impression um I, I could be convinced otherwise but that's just my initial take on it sure fair uh lauren um yeah i i agree i think probably two is a pretty good number if we have um two volunteers um another way i mean i like the really trying to think through a, a variety of stakeholder voices we want to include. Um, also wondering, I don't know the 
I definitely don't want to slow anything down, but wondering if um, if we're hiring creative discourse, if them giving us an idea, because I do think we have a tendency to think of the same kinds of people, and part of the process there is um, that I know we'll go through with the social and economic justice is, you know, who are what are the voices that are not often at these tables and the same people that are part of processes. So I just wanted to flag that that could be something they could maybe quickly and easily say, have you thought about including um, and trying to, you know, have a seat for um, for certain voices. Um, and, you know, and maybe it's here, here are people that we definitely, um, you know, either groups or the, the types of expertise that we want to solicit. And I think that doesn't all need to be people with official like voting member seats, but just people that we're keeping on the list and inviting and, you know, make sure people know that meetings are happening. So I, I don't think they need to be, um, you know, a huge voting group per se, but really thoughtful about how people are being engaged and invited. Uh, Dan. Um, so maybe two, a few sort of overall thoughts. I, I mean, I think it's certainly fine if we have just two counselors, but if three wanted to volunteer, I wouldn't see that as a problem either. I, I think this is a, a working committee. So the more hands to lift the, the boat, the better. Um, I also think that we have to think uh, about the difference in stakeholders that we would want at the committee table versus those we would want this committee to listen to. And when I was thinking about this initially, I was thinking, oh, you know, we probably want, uh, want a representative of the um, either a state attorney's office or some, some judicial arm of, you know, where law enforcement goes. And then I thought, no, you know, as long as that group is, is heard from and, and is, they may not necessarily want to be a decision maker, but I'm sure that they would want their feedback as, as part of this. And so I think we really have to think about, you know, who are the people at the table and, and in part, I, I would, I would want to keep this sort of membership open and not necessarily say, well, I want one person from the business community. I want one person from district one. I want one person who, you know, uh, drives a yellow car. Um, and more keeping in mind in general, when we start to look at who we would appoint to this committee, um, trying to have a balanced set of, of, uh, of voices. Um, and it would be driven, you know, frankly, this is a lot of work to ask anybody to do. Um, and, and if we get people that are willing to do it, that that's a primary qualification for being on the committee. Um, so I think we have to, and, and we have to keep it to a manageable group. If we get it too large, you know, if they're there, you get beyond like 10 people at a table, it gets really hard to schedule everyone to come to the meetings and it gets hard for everybody to sort of talk at these, at these meetings, unless they run really long. Uh, or they're dominated by a, a strong chair. So I think we have to keep it as a, as a good sized working group um, of people that are willing to sort of get their hands into some of these issues and start to have some of these conversations. Um, I also, you know, I also think that it's, um, it, it is something where, you know, we keep it, you know, we may have people who represent, you know, somebody who's a, a resident and a business owner um, and that may have or you know is a crime victim and a business owner that may have a particular perspective um and we wouldn't want to necessarily have boxes that we want to check off um as opposed to just letting people participate um that are willing to take the work on fair enough uh donna and then i have a thought go ahead uh, I, a question procedurally, Mayor, are we actually trying to decide to, in fine detail, or are we just making general suggestions? So I'm just checking how long this conversation is going to be. It's 8.30. <laughs> yes, so these are suggestions that. we're going to send the staff back to, or are we going to leave tonight with a very clear, we want this tonight? I mean, my thought would be that we would leave this conversation with instructions to staff to say, advertise for so many seats. And, okay. and I, I feel like we're kind of at that question actually now, and then we'll be able to have the conversation 
and, and actually to be fair we we maybe don't have to have that conversation tonight about who from council is going to be um a part of it um okay that, that's good i just need to hear that and yeah. i sort of go about the stakeholders the ones at the table to be non-professionals, non-traditional stakeholders, community members who have a perspective, a different perspective about our police, the ones who are not normally at the table, but have very clear opinions. I really wanna see some gra grassroot uh, stakeholders and how can we get them here uh, to the table to talk? And then you bring in all the professionals, all the service groups as resources uh, so that's my bias. Uh, that's all. Fair enough. Madam Mayor, if you will take an input on this topic. Um, yes, uh, go ahead. And and then I, I've got a comment. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's imperative that you consider the impact that the informal community group of people who are speaking up uh, and insisting on changes to the way we allocate our money we're in a financial crisis and a health crisis and if if we are going to reallocate resources you can't use this committee process as a reason to defer that for another year or, or 14 months if if we've got a you know a three million dollar department and we only need a million and a half dollar department now's the time to be thinking about it so we need you know in effect to accelerate this process in time for budget discussions. And I don't know if that's possible. I, I don't want to be brash or unsafe, but I, I'm also willing to volunteer because I'm a unique victim of uh, a victim of a crime by the police department. So I'm happy to bring uh, an enlightened perspective to this discussion, but I do want some urgency. The fact that he used the homelessness task force, which has existed for a year and not even inventory bathrooms, showers, or hand washing is an example where I don't want this to become, you know? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so uh, you raise a, a good point about how we'll be making decisions around um, on the budget. And my, my assumption is that uh, at least for this year, um, it'll be the council that makes um, budgetary decisions, unless the group is, you know, able to make um, some quick decisions um, in, a, in a short amount of time. Otherwise, my assumption is that we will will have the the budget conversation at this level, um, though we will, you know, particularly talk about that. Uh, all right, so. Um, I think probably what makes the most sense, uh, well, what's making sense to me anyway, is that we mostly just decide on um, roughly how many, actually, maybe we don't even need to decide on number of seats. We can probably just say that there's a ballpark and then as we're, as we, you know, get names in, we can, um, we can make an, we can make the size decision once we have names, not necessarily once we have names, but, um, you know, we can see what makes the most sense because, um, unless we are also deciding the number of counselors tonight, um, then, um, I think it makes sense to do that sort of all at once. Any, any opposition to that idea? So it seems like we could probably just, uh, direct staff to, um, to advertise for this uh, board. I can offer a comment. I, I think that's fine um, as far as size goes. That's clear, you know, that makes sense. Um, if I were a, a resident thinking of applying for the board, whatever clarity you want to put in as to the, the purpose or goal or charge for the committee, I, I realize it's going to take some work. Uh, so you might, but whenever you can, say I did write down some of the things, you know, Dan's things and we've got our list and if you want me to just take a stab at synthesizing that I can, but I just want to, you know, be clear that I want to make sure we reflect what you want. Yeah, that list seemed like a, a good list to me. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on the charge of the group, um, a, either in addition or subtraction of that list. Go ahead, Donna. Well, I remember even with the homelessness, I think, you know, you can make a fairly broad 
charge. And then as the group meets and, and they come back to us saying, this is what we think we, we should be looking at for the next six months or whatever. Um, so I don't think it has to be hugely detailed, but it has to be enough so people know whether they're interested in putting their time in and whether it will make a difference if they put their time in. Mm -hmm. I think it, it would be good to make it uh, yeah. clear. And I think it might also be good to at least specify, do, like, do we think quarterly is um, sufficient now, or do we let that group decide? Um, maybe they want to meet more frequently. I don't know. And to be clear, the quarterly part was really for reviewing certain data. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I think some of the other work might be. It was I, we were. I was thinking, you know, and the chief and I were thinking once we get through some of the, the first heavy lifting, the committee may evolve to a group that that now we've made some changes and they want to look at the the trends in the data and talk and have a place to take complaints from the public or what, whatever. Um, but that, you know, uh, we weren't necessarily saying quarterly right from the gate on all these issues. Yeah, I, I have a suggestion that might work. Um, we'll take a stab at drafting a charge. I'll put it in the weekly memo this Friday so that you all and the public can see it um, and before we advertise it. And if people have objections, let me know. I don't hear anything we'll, or anything major. Um, I'll go forward next week, and we'll put the ad out. Yeah. Do you need Do you need a motion for that? Wouldn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a motion? Sure. I'll make I'll make a motion um, that we direct staff um, to create a charge based on the um, the language that we have discussed in, in this meeting in, in particular i'll send bill um the written items that i had i had itemized along with the contents of um, the city manager's may memo to the city council to develop a charge for a subcommittee on public safety um, authority uh, with with a goal to advertise for potential public members somewhat convoluted but i think it gets us there okay we so one of the things that oh wait, sorry is there a second second okay um one of the things i want to be a little bit intentional about here is what we're calling it and you, you just called it a public safety authority all right um, i mean you meant advisory. Public advisory. Um, okay. <clears throat> It'd be clear if we called it police. I mean, I we suggested public safety thinking that over time, you know, might want to look at fire department statistics too, but we do have the public safety authority and it could get confusing. So maybe for now the focus is on police and we ought to just call it what it is. And that that was my bad. I was the one that said public safety. So. How, how do you feel about that, uh, Dan and Jack, since you, that's okay? Fine with me. I'm fine with it. Okay. Donna, go ahead. Well, just in the document, Brian uses the term in the very last when it comes to city ordinances. He calls it a public safety advisory committee. And I didn't know if that was a different group, Bill. Uh, Brian? No, it's all meant to be the same. Uh, Brian and I drafted this together. And if, if you go right back to the very beginning where it says committee, the actual second paragraph, it calls it the Public Safety Advisory Committee. And again, I think we were thinking that over time, yeah. you know, people might want to say, well, how's the fire department doing? But I think that's, they can, we can change to that. And we do have the public safety authority, yeah. so it might be clearer to make sure this is something different. So that, that I should have thought of that. I'm sorry. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was another group. Thank you. No, I think police is good. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And oppose. Okay. Uh, so, and Stephanie, I know you were interested in talking about that second part of the memo. Um, I hope you hang in there. We're, we're going to take a, a quick break, um, and then we'll come back to that um, part. Is that okay, team? How long? Okay. Oh, good question. Let's go five minutes. 
It's five, it's five enough? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to aim for five. <laughs> well, you're the boss, so we have to wait for you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no thanks. I mean, you could. You could carry on. Um, all right, so... Um, all right, so just uh, taking up specifically the second part of that memo uh, that addressed um, some of the requests that we got. Um, so I think to start this, um, Stephanie, since you wanted to talk about that, would you like to start? Sure. And hopefully you'll excuse the toddler squeals. He is a late nighter. Um, well, first of all, I agree with Donna on who should be on the subcommittee in terms of not law enforcement. I think it should be community members who represent a perspective that's not already there. It just seems like if we be, if that group would be coming together to talk about new solutions to change the future of policing, it wouldn't be appropriate to have law enforcement on there. That would make it feel to me and I think to other members of the community like it was um, sabotaging the effort from the get-go and just making it into an empty gesture. So um, I'm glad that Donna said that. Um, my other comments were about the rest of the memo. Um, it makes me feel like a lot of our demands have been dismissed as not being, um, and I quote, directly related to inherent bias concerns. And the thing is, none of the residents in the community were, that you're referring to here actually said that this was about bias. The whole point of systemic racism is that it's inherent in these systems we're discussing, even in the absence of any bias in a particular individual. So um, that's what many of us had been trying to convey, I had at least. And I was discouraged by the fact that it seems like you're ruling out taking action on things because they don't relate to bias, again, in quotes, when that's not even what people were asking you to address in the first place. I plan to email a response to all of the responses, but um, right here I just thought I'd address one in particular. Um, you're right, the budget is the most substantive issue, but it's not everything. I wanted to talk about something that seemed to be a glaring example of how something doesn't need to be about bias in order to be about systemic racism and other big problems, and how something that doesn't seem like it's about policing actually is. And that was the item about um, banning the use of prisoner labor by the city and ending all contracts with corrections. So um, I just want to read this for anyone who doesn't have it in front of them. Uh, you had said, this is not about police or bias. The only use of corrections crews is by the cemetery for lawn mowing and grounds maintenance. This particular work crew is made up of volunteer inmates who are able to reduce their sentences by performing the services. So first of all, I want to say this is about police and bias, because how do you think these people got to prison in the first place, if not for police, and um, if not for bias, that potentially affected the course of their sentencing? So all of this is connected, which I've been trying to get across, and I know others have been as well. Anyway, regardless, I just want everyone to think more about this because I don't want it to be something that's dismissed. In regards to this particular crew of volunteer inmates, first of all, volunteer, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, if your offense is considered mild enough that doing some lawn work might reduce your sentence, you're in a situation where you're buying your freedom by working. So instead of supporting our local economy by paying an individual or a company to do this work who would then go out and spend their money in the community, we're paying a literal prison and we're supporting modern day well, you're literally supporting modern day slavery to maintain the grounds of the cemetery. And for what? I mean, don't we care about who the city business with? I was thinking about how like cosmetics companies garner support and goodwill by refusing to test their products on animals. And shouldn't we be able to proudly state that Montpelier uncategorically does not employ prisoners, period? Not now and not ever. It doesn't matter who this particular work crew is or why they're in prison. What matters is that Montpelier no longer participates in the prison industrial complex for something that it can pay someone else to do. A local company that employs people for fair pay who live within the community and not behind bars. So yeah, that, this is just one of the 11 demands that we're discuss, discussing and that you addressed here, but I wanted to highlight it because it's something we can't so easily dismiss. Uh, I, I just think it's, it's indicative of a larger problem that I and others have been bringing here, and um, it's really disappointing to see it kind of, well, again, dismissed as not being part of whatever this problem is, which, by the way, isn't the problem we were presenting. Uh, so that's that's basically my comment, but I do want to encourage you to think about that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. First of all, I'm sorry if you felt dismissed, Stephanie. Um, we were just trying to figure out, so and if we misinterpreted your statements about this being about systemic racism or inherent bias, then I apologize for that. That appeared to me at least, and I think many of us on staff, that that was the message. So we were just trying to parse which of these 
were directly related to that or which weren't. Um, and with regard to the, the cemetery here, you point loud and clear, I guess, for just a, another, you know, our police certainly don't arrest people just so that we can have people that mow the cemetery. And here, here the point loud and clear, we could be paying somebody else to do that. Um, it's also a case of, you know, and I completely agree with you, by the way, about the prison industrial complex and all of that fairness and sentencing. We unfortunately don't really have anything to do with that. And if there are prisoners that can reduce their time, um, and when I say volunteer, they they choose, they can, I, you're right, they're in prison, but they're not made to do this. They say we'd like to be part of this crew because they can reduce their time. Uh, and so is there a social good there if, if there are people to be coming back to society and learning work skills? That said, the other piece of this is that the Cemetery Commission is actually a, somewhat, a separate independent body from the City Council. So while we work very cooperatively with them, that's actually a decision that the Cemetery Commission is going to have to make. And I probably should have been more explicit about that in the memo. I do know they're taking it up. I don't know the exact date, but I was told that it's on one of their upcoming agendas. So um, stay tuned. Other thoughts or comments? Um, I I would just say, um, uh, Stephanie, I also, like when I, just in reading through that, um, there were there were some parts that started like, you know, this is not related to bias. And I, I will confess, I had a similar reaction in that I was like, well, it could be, you know, like it's maybe not like directly related, but it's, you know, but I mean, I, I live in a world where like, I mean, I teach physics, right? Like, and I think about how like everything is physics. <laughs> um, it all, it all relates. And, and, you know, maybe that's not a great analogy, but like, it certainly, it certainly relates, um, even if it's not um, direct. Um, and, you know, for any one of those um, items, like happy to have more conversation about those. And to be fair, um, you know, the entity that we just created would probably be a good place to start. But even in the interim, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about what any of those um, could look like. So um, in, any, in any case, uh, thank you. And um, any other comments? Well, Lauren, go ahead. And then Jack. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to echo, I, I kind of had a similar reaction, like it, it felt a little disjointed to me to, on the one hand, be like, let's create a group that can like dig in, and on the other, let's already answer a bunch of questions that I think do bear further conversation. And, um, you know, so I, I don't want to approach this committee and, you know, assume that a bunch of issues have already been dealt with and answered and checked off the list. and. Um, you know, dismissed out of hand, but more like, okay, let's have these on the table. Let's see what other issues are coming up from community members and stakeholders. Um, and, you know, so I hope we can really start it off with a um, inclusive process that is really hearing from each other and digging into, you know, why were these issues raised? What else is missing? You know, how, how do we move forward? Um, and I think part of that is, again, is going to be some work on, you know, what are, I think, shared values and vision, and there's, I'm hoping, short-term ideas and recommendations, and then longer-term um, ideas and recommendations, um, so that's that's my hope. Great. Thanks, Jack. Just very briefly, I read, I thought that the uh, memo from the chief and the manager was a constructive uh, contribution to the discussion. And uh, what I see them doing here is for some of the issues that were raised to try to respond as readily as they could to issues that they, uh, they could have a straightforward response to. I also think though that it's very clear that uh, the new police uh, advisory committee that we're establishing is going to have uh, a broad scope of activity. And, and the fact that the uh, city manager, or the police chief, has one opinion on a topic does not foreclose further discussion or, or disagreement. So I'm, I'm not worried about uh, 
the commission being unduly constrained in uh, in what it takes up. Yeah, I I want to add to uh, what I was saying before as well. I because I agree it was it, it was helpful. Um, so I think it's uh, it's important to know sort of what the background is for for some of those um, topics and requests. So um, yeah, so anyway, grateful. Um, Donna. Well, I appreciated the list and maybe I was just sensitive, but I found the tone just condescending. Um, I just really did. I mean, I mean, to a list that there were 11 requests, I mean, I felt, would you normally say that? Um, so I, I think we, we need to look at that seriously and try to get away from it if possible. And it's hard. It's hard for all of us um, when we're looking at what we see and what we understand. And that's part of the hard work we're all doing now. So please take the criticism as I intended it. It's not something I don't do myself. So just keep it in mind when you're writing. Well, I appreciate that. And I want to be really clear um, that I was the drafter of this. You know, Brian had provided me the feedback. So if it, I, I just don't want him to take the, the fall for this, that um, the, the words were mine. And that uh, certainly, you know, it's interesting actually looking at it again, I can see the point, you know, where we were trying to be sort of, I was trying to be sort of matter of fact, um, and I can see why people would object to that. And I think to, to just to explain, um, and, and certainly I'm happy to acknowledge if, if I fell down anywhere was to try to respond to what we know factually, so, you know, to me, there's a lot of really interesting policy discussions here. And to the extent that, and, and I don't want to, you know, I certainly can't speak for the, the group, but that some of the issues which may have a legal obstacle or, you know, in my view, at least, you know, pay, pay adjustments for police officers, those kind of things, you know, that is separate from the size of the police department and the functions and all those kinds of things. And so it was, so how do we, how do we focus in, in, you know, the 11, I mean, they gave us a list and they said, we have 11 demands. I wasn't trying to be pejorative about that. That was how it was presented to us. I just want to respond to them similarly to the, you know, we'd had eight before and we res I responded to those in the bridge, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, my, I think I was like, where can we really, where's the room for really constructive conversation that can move this forward and where is stuff that, you know, is, and, and I appreciated Stephanie's comment, you know, there may be more nuance there than I was giving it credit for and that's on me. So, fair enough. No worries, thank you. Mayor, I have a comment. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, the, I wanted just to use an, an example of it, this inherent bias. Um, the, there's no one but Billy, no one but a homeless person would the, would the officer steal their unopened beers. I mean, there's, I, I mentioned this three times now, there's no evidentiary value to an unopened beer that a homeless person spent, you know, precious nickel cans collecting, you know? So the treatment, uh, I know the treatment I get when I drive a newer car for than when I drive an older car. Uh, and I watch the, the disparity of treatment of how this community, despite its, you know, self, uh, perception of progressive liberal, you know, compassionate has, has neglected, you know, toilets for old people and homeless people for over a year. So the, the bias is, is inherent in the, in the system. And while I don't, I wouldn't come at uh, my petition for change with uh, a list of demands because I'm likely to not get them met and then they weren't really that demanding. Um, maybe it's a poor choice of words, but when you're going up against the power of incumbency, you know, a sophisticated $130,000 a year city manager who, you know, is expert at, at you know, manipulating information. You know, you've got to, you've got to learn, and we have to basically build the capacity among our citizens to hold our officials accountable. And that's what I see going on here. So, I, I, I would ask you to consider those as legitimizing some of the requests and the the uh, direction that you're hearing from this emerging citizens group. So, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, all right. I think we're probably ready to move on unless other, anyone else wants to uh, address this topic. Chief Pete, would you like to talk about this at all? Uh, no, uh, well, just good evening. I just didn't want to, I just wanted to give everybody just to say hello and uh, and thank everybody for the constructive, uh, for the dialogue and, and uh and, and for everything, and I, please forgive me, I got a little science headache going on. It's not COVID, um, but I just all I ask is as we as we move, I, I consider myself a very reasonable person, um, and with that, I'm just asking that as we move forward in in, in in working with the community, that we're talking and we have constructive dialogue together. You can't make decisions about like, for example, in NAMI, one of the biggest things in mental health is, you know, don't know conversations about us without us. And, 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 and we're talking about an institution wide thing. Everybody needs to be respected. Everybody needs to be heard, but everybody needs to be constructive in the conversation. So I just want to make sure that I listen to anybody. I can learn from everyone. But as we, as we move forward with the, with the group, I'm just hoping for people who are open-minded and who want to learn as much from me and my experiences as I can learn from them and their experiences. And that the, the concept is that we work together to strengthen something. Um, and and that, that's my only hope and my only ask for this. And thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. And uh, I agree. I think that is gonna be an important quality for anybody who participates in that committee. Uh, okay, and just to clarify, um, one of the comments that Stephanie made was about Donna's comment about um, staff participation. And I, I mean, my assumption is that uh, this committee that we've that we're that we've asked um, staff to create will be staffed um, and. I think, you know, in that same spirit, I know that was not um, something that, uh, you know, Stephanie just articulated support for, but I, I think it makes sense actually to have um, participation of, um, well, that, that whoever staffs it from the city be um, police officer and probably the chief. Um, but of course, that's, that's your, your decision um, as uh, staff folk. Oh, humbly, ma'am, I'm just I'm looking for just folks who are just going to volunteer to work with me. I, I have I, I I look at it as a, as a team of community members who are going to provide impact and help us to see and find out different ways that we can address the needs that we that we need to address going into you know mm -hmm. our, our next few years. So it, it, it's I'm just I'm looking for a partnership team. Um, that can help me. So like for one of the things, for example, is if we're talking about how do we improve minority and diversity recruitment, you know, it, it would make sense to me to say if, if, if I've got a very robust relationship with with members of the LGBTQ community, how can I reach out and, and, and how what are the things that I need to do and to show that we're very open force and that we want to have people, you know, how do we, how do we appeal? What are we missing? Cause we can't see the, the forest from when we're living in the trees. So I'm just looking for that, that partnership and groups that are going to help us to provide safety um, for the city. And then we make sure that we do it in a very fair um, and a, a fair way for everyone. Yeah. Any further comments on that part? Okay. Madam Mayor, briefly on this on this staffing issue, I just want to recount before I resigned from the homelessness task force, it was due to the staffing basically suppressing ideas before they were allowed to develop. The idea of sanctioned camping areas that are sorely needed by the unhoused. So they don't have the police don't have the free right to just rouse them and move them along at whim. You know, in a discriminatory manner, even the people that aren't making trouble. So the idea of having staff has to be limited to a non-intrusive, to keeping notes, not basically prejudging what will and won't fly and suppressing it. That's that's what killed the Hellness's task force effectiveness, in my opinion. So just a note of caution here that okay. what I hear Chief Pete's idea of what this is is to advise him on how to do it but I believe there's a need for a broader discussion on what is our expected role and how might it need to be changed. So 
uh, that's a caution on staffing, and I'll call it a night. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, I think we're probably good to move on. Any further comments? Okay. Um, all right, so we are up to our COVID-19 update. And so for this, I would turn it over to Cameron. Hello. Um, Hello. Let me pull these up because I have also combined uh, resuming um, meetings in person, a new uh, recommendation for you. So in general, um, this was a pretty uh, busy COVID month since we last met. Um, I'll just briefly go over a few things that I think will be important to call out for folks in the community. Um, the ACCD Recovery Resource Center has a link um, to help landlords and property owners repair um, homes and rental units. Up to $30,000 uh, in grant funds are available to make sure that um, the housing availability in Vermont is of quality and is affordable and available to all. Um, there is a new capital equipment assistance program open for applications for um, farmers to get new equipment for nutrition management planning. That's at the Department of Agriculture and is open now. The ACCD has updated their current re restaurant and lodging guidance. So restaurants and bars can now use bar seating if patrons are six feet apart and there's a partition between the bar and the bartender, um, the capacity limits for restaurants have not changed, just that bars are open. ACCD also removed capacity limits from all lodging properties like hotels, allowing them to book all of their available rooms if they want to. Um, there is now also uh, free technical assistance available through the Small Business Recovery Technical Assistance Program. Um, to help folks um, get some new resources, and that's also through ACCD. The schools had some significant updates this week, too. Um, I thought I would start including that because that has been a focus of our, uh, the governor's press conferences. They have moved to a step three opening plan starting this set Saturday, September 26th. This means uh, that they will allow interscholastic competitions for their sports events and programs. They can consider the use of common areas like gyms and cafeterias and um, allows the schools more flexibility in grouping students outside of the pod model they were using before. So I would direct folks to the um, education department's website and then also know that our travel map for the state is now going to be updated on Tuesdays instead of Fridays. Um, and our city communications also remains very high in engagement. And we are, um, as you heard earlier with our winter programming uh, discussion, our winter parking discussion, looking at different ways to communicate with the public. So um, that is my COVID update. Does anyone have any questions on that part? It's just great news. Um, kids are psyched to be able to play interscholastic sports. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Donna. Um, I had a, um, two residents ask me if pickleball is going to be started at the rec department. So I read what was listed. I didn't see it. So if I don't see it specifically listed, it's not restarted? Um, no, we. I didn't include any of our rec updates right now. Um, we will. We are working on getting the website more up to date. Um, we're still not opening this the rec center for games inside, but pickleball is still welcome and open on all of our tennis courts right now. So folks are able to play at their own risk on our tennis courts. All the stuff for pickleball is there, but we're still not opening up the rec center. Yeah, they were they were looking for inside. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I will move into. Um, the next bit, which is the resuming in-person uh, city council meetings. Um, we had a really great discussion last time about that, and there was a really great idea brought up about opening up um, council chambers for the public to use. That gives a nice space where people can come in and, and be in city hall. 
and opening the council chamber up so that it could be its own sort of Zoom station. So if y'all don't want to be there, you do not have to be there. We would sort of let anyone be in our space in the city council chamber. Um, we have an extra laptop in there for the for that room. It's been in there. Um, so we can set that up as its own Zoom portal so folks could interact if they want to speak to y'all. Um, they can walk up to that computer, interact with that computer um, without any touching or, or anything like that. Um, because you know the distance on a laptop is pretty great. You can sit pretty far back from it. And so um, anyone would be able to be a participant on a Zoom platform while still maintaining social distance and being in the council chambers. So that's what I would recommend. That's the staff recommendation. I also included the other proposals for in-person um, configurations. There is um, a fiscal uh, component to that because we would need to upfit the council chambers a little bit, but um, the good news is those grants have been extended until October 1. So if that is your choice and you want to move forward with that, we can, we can still apply for um, uh, getting funding for things like a plexiglass barrier. So I have two thoughts on this. So one is that um, at some point we are going to go back to being in person and it would probably make some sense to figure out which path we want to pursue. And if, if it means that we need to apply for funding to pay for things like plexiglass, then we should, we should do that. My second thought is that just by choosing a path doesn't mean that we have to go back right now if that's not what we feel is right for this, you know, for this moment. If it's not imminent, that's okay. Um, so there's, I, I, again, so I, I see this as like two separate questions. Are we ready to, to pursue any one of these now? And then the second one being like, which, which option <laughs> do we like? Um, so curious for your thoughts, team. Go ahead, Jack. I have a question, and I don't know if this is even feasible, but if we set up plexiglass barriers between each pair of seats on the dais, are we still required to maintain six feet of interpersonal distance, physical distance? I think that's recommended. Um, it is a barrier, just like a mask is a barrier, but it's a barrier and, right? So um, I would I would recommend the plexiglass and masks if you wanted to go down that road. Um, I think that that would probably reduce the risk of the six foot transmission, but that, I mean, I guess it's really up to y'all's comfort level because it's all suggestions anyway. Thanks. You know, I think there's an issue, right? The plexiglass would go as far back as the desk goes, but the chairs go further back and you've got a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I think depend like i guess to interject the recommendation the first recommendation of allowing in-person meeting space available for the public we've talked internally and the staff that stays here um, is comfortable with that um, level of engagement with the community um, we feel like we have pretty strong um, you know ppe protection here we've got really great cleaning procedures in place and so regardless on if y'all would like to be physically here, I would like to be able to set that up for the public regardless, if that is okay with you as a whole. Um, because I, you know, I did, we did hear a lot about how that impacts folks last time we talked about this. And I think it would be important to offer that as an option. Uh, Lauren and then Dan. Um, yeah, I, I really like the idea and appreciate the 
you know, um, working to set up a, a station and even having the building open one evening a week um, seems seems like a great idea. Um, I mean, I think it's to Anne's point, is there is there a downside or what kind of cost share is there for the grant? I mean, it does seem like, you know, there's so many unknowns about how long this will go on. So having that available for for this purpose or even if it could be you know, other city purposes. Um, at some point, if it's a resource we can get grant funding for now, should we just apply you for the plexiglass? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's really really that, if it's just literally plexiglass or if there's any anything more, but. <laughs> Not really, no. The, yeah. the plexiglass that we've gotten, it's just that. It's They set it up so that it can like rest on either side of a desk and they just set it up that way. So they've done it for the rest of our desks, so. Um, that's something we can explore, um, and we'll we'll look into that. I, I don't see any reason not to. And I think either way, the um, setting up the community opportunity seems like a great thing in the short term to get going. Madam Mayor, I've got a comment on this. Um, yeah, uh, Dan's next, and then you can go after Dan. Sure. Okay. Um, we talked last time about um, alternative spaces, and I'm thinking in particular the, um, the stage space upstairs on the second floor. Um, it, one of the limitations seemed to be ORCA and whether or not they could run lines up there or cameras. Um, was that looked into at all? Um, I have not spoken to ORCA. Okay. It just, I mean, I think that's, it strikes me that, you know, we can try and retrofit the council chambers as uh, a safe space, but there are inherent limitations as you have very well outlined, Cameron, in your, your memos that, you know, we're basically putting band-aids on this, trying to make it work, as opposed to exploring other potential spaces that have a broader you know, just thinking there's a way to socially distance upstairs in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, the Lost Nation space and the voting space because it's a big, wide open, uh, you know, half court gymnasium. Um, or, I mean, there's th there are other spaces like that around town if we wanted to really explore those opportunities. Um, and it, it strikes me that those might be more offer uh, more flexibility overall it's just whether or not um you know they would they would have inherent limitations like filming that would make it make it uh, a limitation on us but i i'd like to explore i'd like to see that explored um as as another space where we could sort of break out of the limitations that we're just going to face no matter which way we turn it in the council chambers for the time being i'll talk to orca Cool. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, so I'm aware that ORCA has a box, a, a streaming box that's portable, and if they can get an Ethernet connection, they can. It, it won't be the full high resolution uh, signal that they normally get out of the city council chamber. It'll be streaming only, but so is Zoom. So it's not a lot lost. But I would encourage you to start with the city council chamber and get that set up. I did mention last time you need to think about ventilation in any space, even the large space. You need to think about heat recovery ventilation because it's the the, the aerosol uh, partners of a protected particles of a protected potentially infected person that is going to be the hazard. And the energy grant that we talked about or that was available or made a presentation and or other state funding. You could exhaust the city council chamber effectively through the side windows and recover the heat from the outgoing. Uh, but that needs to be planned and engineered quicker. But I would suggest that you proceed also because you're talking about moving the pocket park, you're talking about bathrooms, you're talking about winter and camping areas. There's a disenfranchised population here that is routinely ignored that they need a place to come in and make themselves heard. I've been talking to them, but they don't feel like they have a voice. They don't have phones. They don't have Zoom installed on laptops. 
So if they, if you really want to take some of these issues seriously and hear from the affected people, you need to make a place where they can participate. So, uh, those are some ideas. I would not wait. I would move forward with the city council. I applaud, uh, the work that was done on thinking about that, get started on the ventilation issue. And then maybe as a phase two, if you overcrowd the city council chamber, which is, I believe is unlikely, uh, then you could move upstairs into a bigger room. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jack. Would it be uh, an appropriate time to uh, make a motion? Uh, and I'll, I'll make the motion. I'll see if there's a second. I move that we direct the city staff to uh, proceed with uh, proposal one to, as a first step, uh, open up the city council chambers for, uh, for public participation in our meetings while we're addressing the other issues we need to address. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Uh, Go ahead, I didn't Dan. Know what you meant by one and two? I think um, it was just on mo on proposal one to do one. something. The two was like to not the number two. Right. Okay, proposal one is, is in-person meeting space made available for the public in council. I understood the one. I just didn't understand okay. the T-O-O. -O. Thank you. T-O. T-O. Um, Jack, did you have something else you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I also agree with Dan that I'd like to see us explore if we can set up council uh, meetings for in-person meetings in the uh, auditorium space, we can space it out so we can be all be six feet apart. Um, that's that takes some more doing. But uh, so that's not part of my motion, except that I think the uh, staff are probably getting the sense that at least some of us are interested in exploring that. That seems fair. And I, um, you know, I, we're going to vote on this motion, but um, I think another part of this is considering whether or not we move forward with plexiglass so that we have it if we need it, unless, unless you don't need a motion around that. Um, doesn't hurt. We'll look into it. Um, I would say it requires upfront capital. It's a reimbursement grant only. So we'll, we will just look into that as, as an option. Okay. Seriously. And then we will also uh, look about how we can configure upstairs if that's an option. Okay. Uh, Donna. Well, when you're indoors, the ventilation is as important as the six feet apart. So I would like for the staff to look at what kind of ventilation improvements would be needed, whether it's in the, the lower council chambers or upstairs in the auditorium. Even though it's big, it's still not well ventilated. They sealed all those windows for winter savings. Um, so I, I, you know, I have lots of anxiety about going inside in the fall and the winter. I think that it's wonderful that people are having sports and we're not having the bars open, but to me that just means a likelihood of another breakout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm sort of in a wait and watch mode, yeah. but I'm concerned about the ventilation. So if you check that, that'd be good. If I might add to that, I mean, I, this might be inherent in your request, Donna, but um, I think of it as separate is the filtration, um, making sure that the filtration is. I know our senior center got a few standalone um, filtration systems, so we do have a price that we can look at for that as well. Um, so we will look into that as well. Okay, great. Okay, well, there's a motion on the table. Um, any further discussion? This is about opening council chambers up to the public. Go ahead. Oh, yes, Dan. Sorry, just one clarification. I mean, I, I guess in looking at the space, I, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't understand this motion have to be changed for that, but I would I would assume that there would be an ability to, to look beyond, I mean, I suggested the upstairs, but, you know, there's a number of large public spaces in town. There's the auditorium at the basement of the pavilion. Whether or not the state would ever let us in there is, a, is another question, but... 
um, you know, there are various churches and, um, you know, there's city center itself. And the question, you know, I think we have to think outside of the box on some of this stuff and if it was available or applicable. Um, but I would understand that 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 would be part of what the staff wouldn't necessarily need a motion, but can simply look into some of those ideas as well. Mm -hmm. I'll look into it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Heather, did you, you just turned your camera on. Would you like to say something? Yeah, sorry, I got lost a little bit. So the meetings would still be available for the public through Zoom too. Yes. yes. And as under the staff's proposal, the council members would still at this point be participating by Zoom. And the, it's a proposal to open up council chambers so people who want to come in in person to be to speak to the council but don't have the ability to log on themselves would have that as a way to address the council um donna i saw you had a hand well just to follow up dan's proceeding to look elsewhere i would want the staff to consider it and give us an idea what is the inconvenience of us not being in that building staff goes to their offices or waits in their offices or copies things i just would want a mindset of how inconvenient to have council meetings outside of the building would be for staff if you just have that in your mindset thank you i also assume that other places would require a rental fee yeah but, sorry go ahead yeah yeah no i i mean i I, I think that's all fitting into the, the feasibility is just, you know, because we're looking at these two different options, I wouldn't want, you know, because I, I, you know, just if there was a facility that said, sure, you're welcome to use it and it did fit our needs well, I wouldn't want to avoid, have, have looked so narrowly that we missed looking at that other available space. But all of these, none of these are perfect. It would be great to go turn back the clock to January and go back to council chambers and all sit around and eat Twizzlers, but you know, that's not where we're at right now. I should probably throw away the Twizzlers that are in yeah. that desk. I didn't did. get any Twizzlers. Who passed those around? I, I, I did. I didn't t pass them around. I have chocolate. <laughs> they last forever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, and uh, so the last item for regular business is... Mayor? Uh, oh, yes. Be before we get off the COVID report and COVID topic, um, I, I heard the... Uh, Assistant City Manager say that there's uh, there's funding available to municipalities to make COVID related um, expenditures of various kinds, and that gets me that I immediately thought of whether you know we've been hearing suggestions for even at night opening up the uh, downstairs bathrooms for people to come in and use them. And I think that that's been the reaction has been that that seems to be impractical because and probably because of uh, security and needs to uh, isolate the bathrooms and and the uh, stairwell and, uh, and vestibule from the rest of the building. And so I just wonder, is it possible to look at what physical changes would be needed and whether that's something that uh, we could get reimbursed from the federal uh, COVID relief funds to do. Well, I will say that um, one, thank you. That proposal is going to be on my next, uh, the October 14th agenda regarding the, the bathroom update. We are looking into that and how much that would cost. I would need to do more research if that was a refundable cost. They aren't necessarily doing tangentially related costs. We could loosely say that because some other bathrooms have been closed, we need more bathroom facilities, but I'm not sure if that would be something that they would reimburse and we might be on the hook for the funding. So I would need to look into that and ask um, our uh, 
some of our partner agencies that have been helping us with this is funding um, these grants to ask them if they think that's something that would go through. So I'm not sure, and we will look into it. Oh man, we're just in sync, aren't we? <laughs> okay. Good place to be. All right. Um, okay, so uh, the last item is looking at the calendar for uh, the next couple of months as some of the days fall on uh, holidays. So um, I don't think we need to change anything in October. Is that? Yeah, we would we'd make a very impassioned request that we don't change the October 14 date. We just have a lot of things already teed up for that. Um, you know, after that, we've got more flexibility, but um, we would okay. love to keep the 14th. I think the key, so there's there's three dates that are really problematic, uh, specifically problematic. One is November 11, which is the what would normally be our first uh, November meeting, and that falls on Veterans Day. I mean, we always have a meeting right around then, but it's either the day before, but this, you know, it actually falls on the holiday. You know, we could still meet if we wanted, but, you know, there, there's that. The second November meeting is would be the 25th, which is the night before Thanksgiving. And that's a, that's been an annual conflict that comes up because we meet the fourth week and that's always, and so typically we've just moved that to the third week. Um, you know, I think way back, we sometimes would move it from Wednesday to Monday, but the last several years we've just met what would be the 18th this year. But as Jack correctly pointed out, uh, not only is the 11th a holiday, but then that's two weeks in a row. And then we have a similar issue the fourth week of December where we would be scheduled to meet the 23rd, which is Festivus, but um, so technically is not conflict with the Christmas holiday, but it certainly is close enough, I think, for a lot of people, certainly members of the public and others that might be traveling or, or whatever. Uh, and again, we have in the years past moved that meeting as well to the week before, so that would be the 16th. Um, and I just say, you know, once we get into December, particularly this year, um, you know, we may need, you know, budget may be a lot more complex this year than it's been in prior years. So we may need to meet weekly anyway, or have, have an extra meeting in there. I hope not, but I think that's probably the reality. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, but th those are the, so the December 23rd, November 25th and November 11th are very specific conflicts with holidays and how you want to move it after that. Um, I will note that, not that this is a big deal for us, um, but the first and third weeks are typically the school board weeks. So for people who are trying to follow both, I see Mr. Delcor on the line and uh, others, but you know, the press and the public that want to participate with both groups, that is a conflict. So we've, we've tried to work around it. Obviously, occasionally it happens and there's that. So that's what I have to say. You can schedule your meetings when you want. We'll be here. Okay. Um, Jack, you had a proposal about this um, in a previous meeting. Do you want to talk about what, um, your or your thoughts on it? I did, and my proposal in started out by doing, uh, by for one thing, uh, covering October too. The theory being that that by starting in October, that's the way to keep us two weeks apart for almost all of these meetings. Um, but I hear what the manager said about specifically not screwing up with things, screwing things up that we already have, uh, have scheduled. Um, so I'm happy to have us meet whenever Bill thinks we should meet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would propose uh, for just November meeting on the first and third so that we avoid Veterans Day and the day before Thanksgiving. And I know that that puts us on the same night as the school board. But, you know, it, that kind of thing is actually pretty normal for this time of year. Um, so, you know, it just happens. Um, so that's 
one part of it. And then, and actually uh, for December, um, the 16th is actually also the sixth day of Hanukkah. Um, so, uh, you know, like I, I think it would be better if we could um, move it to like, well, I guess my proposal would be that we move it to the second and the ninth. Um, I realize that's two weeks in a row, um, but that also allows us time. Like if we decided that we did, we, you know, urgently needed to meet <laughs> um, more uh, because it's a complicated budget that, that gives us a little more flexibility with a later part of December, potentially. Um, other thoughts? I mean, and this doesn't have to be what we do. That's just, I'm, I'm putting it out there. What do you think? That that's fine with me too. So before eighteen two and nine. Yep. Before and then, in theory, we wouldn't meet again in, from between December nine and January six. No way. <laughs> I mean January yeah January well January thirteen but technically. 13. Right, but we almost always, and if we follow the schedule, we almost certainly will need budget meetings in the beginning of January. Fair enough. But, but we do, do have possibilities of the 29th and 30th in December if we had to. Oh, during the holiday week? Yeah, I mean, if we had to do a special, I, I'm not wanting it. I'm just saying if we had a, a real demand, and that's not in anyone's holiday, there well, be I, less traveling this year than in most years. I mean, that is a good point. And so maybe we'll just take stock of the ninth and see where we are and what we need to do. Um, you're right. I mean, there may be less traveling and we're doing things remotely. I mean, it would, it would be somebody coming in here, but I mean, for council members, even if for most of us, even if we were traveling, maybe we could still participate. Uh, it, it, it's going to be. If we have to meet, then it's going to be a heavy lifting meeting. I think that's the thing. It will be a budget meeting. There shouldn't be any, you know, we won't be for some little thing. It would be important. So, I mean, not that they're all, not all important. But. Are you going to end up adding some extra in January to make us pay for some time off? Well, you know, it's not me. <laughs> How fast you get through the budget. I, as far as I'm concerned, if we don't meet till from Jan December 9th to January 13th, I'm sure the staff would love it. I, you know, if you can all, if we can present you a budget on the 9th and you can approve it on the 13th, then with a month in between, to, yeah, good. But I, I, I don't think we'll be able to do that. And I don't think we'll really be on target to, you know, the 9th, that meeting is usually when we present the budget, that first, the second Tuesday in December. And that's usually when we have it ready. And I don't think we'll be able, I, I, I mean, I can talk to Kelly, but I don't think we'll have it ready for the second especially with the, the holiday right before that. Go ahead, Donna. But there's also another meeting we usually change about the timing with um, the ballot and all that's the dates we end up meeting on a Thursday. So right. if we could so get that out earlier, that would be good. Yeah. So this year, actually, so that's interesting too. So that's a good point. I'm glad you reminded me of that, Donna. The way the calendar falls this year the deadline for us to have the budget and the ballot is actually Thursday, January 21. Whoa. Which is the third week because because town meeting this year is like the second or or first the second of March. So it's early. Sorry, can you say that again? When is it? The 40 day deadline yeah. for us to have stuff on the ballot is Thursday, January 21. So the, our last meeting, January 27, would be too late. So we'd have to have our normal Thursday night meeting to get all the petitions and all that in. It'd have to be on the 21st. Uh, assuming. Okay. So we should put that in our calendars now anyway. Yes. So then we can decide, you know, maybe we'll skip the last one in January if necessary, but we certainly would need, you know. Okay. You wouldn't like a little buffer and make it on Wednesday the 20th? Well, we could. So the problem with that is here's the issue that we've run into. And, and again, this is all your decision. But the, de the same legal deadline for us filing our ballot and finalizing the warning 
is also the legal deadline for people that are submitting petitions. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So we could meet on Wednesday, yep. and vote on the warning and vote all that, and then have to come back on Thursday if the petitions are submitted to vote to accept the petition. Yeah. And yeah. Vote. I forgot about those petitions. Yeah, yeah. So that's the reason we've traditionally moved it to Thursday, so the, that one time a year, so that we can do everything on the same night. If there's if there are petitions out there. Okay. Um, so we'll put that together all that calendar and get. Okay. It back. I was gonna say I don't think we need a. Well, do we need a motion on that? I don't think we do. Uh, no one's no one's really opposed to that, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, all right, so that is the end of our regular business. So on to council reports, Donna. Okay, well, I just want to brag Bill and staff, the link that you've put in your manager's report is to mine. Thank you, thank you. I have been struggling to find everybody because particularly short of staff, some committees are having a hard time posting. So if any of the public haven't seen that, go to the manager's weekly report and there's this awesome link to all the meetings going on. It's terrific. I want to thank Dan and the council for his appointment to the Public Safety Authority Board. I want to mention that the Park Commission did discuss uh, the Gruton Park perhaps finding a place for it. In fact, the new pump station that was part of what was opened this last week when they opened the extended bike path, it could be there, a place for parents particularly to sit and wait while their kids are having fun on the pump station. So at least they're discussing it and they're gonna come back to the city council with an option for us to consider. Uh, also, I wanna really um, pleased to say that the rec department put in an application to renovate the bathrooms at the pool house. And I got the pleasure of signing a support letter that they wrote beautifully. <laughs> so let's hope they get the money. Um, and the other thing is I really do think that Steve uh, Whitaker has a, a point about us getting to the public bathrooms. We need to do something. And whether that's directing staff, committee, whatever we need to move that forward the months are coming that are going to be nastier than now and it's sad watching people hunt for bathrooms thank you okay thank you uh connor uh not too much um i, th I think at some point i you know especially as bill saying that the ballot has to be ready in january it might be worth a discussion if there are any potential charter changes that we need um to sort of adapt to the new uh, pandemic economy. I, I, I felt in several cases, we were sort of waiting on the state um, to make some big decisions here. And uh, just that maybe we could start putting a list together of things we think would be a comprehensive charter change uh, to give us a bit more control. I also like the idea, um, I think we said it a couple meetings ago, just acknowledging that the economy is not gonna be coming back to normal anytime soon. You know. If you look at Australia, they've closed the borders till 23, I think, you know. Um, what, what, do, what should we be taking into consideration as we form the new budget? And, you know, how will that be different than what we've done in the past there? Because I think business as usual isn't going to get the job done going forward. So I think having some of those discussions right now rather than, um, you know, when we need to do it um, would be helpful. So that's it for me tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I'm going to take a pass. I don't have anything. Thanks. All right. Uh, Dan. Thanks. Um, I want to offer congratulations to John Holler, who led the uh, extended bike path project. And uh, I, I was unable to make it out to the to ribbon cutting, but um, uh, to my great disappointment. But it, I have gone out there, and it looks fantastic. Um, I'll echo some of Connor's concerns about, um, you know, where we go as a, as a city this fall and this next year with continuing um, issues, COVID related issues, shutdown related issues. Um, I think we have to keep close attention as the weather turns. And I was reminded this week as the weather turned really cold, some of the benefits that we've been enjoying about out outdoor activity, outdoor dining are going to start to go away. Um, and then as Donna mentioned, you know, that's when, uh, we go back inside when outbreaks reemerge. Um, <laughs> but I think we have to be, be thoughtful uh, because I think as a community, we're going to have to, 
really prepare for another onslaught. So that I'll leave it there on that happy note. Um, great. Thanks, Jack. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, also congratulations to MAMBA, the Montpelier Area Mountain Bike Association, uh, the, Rec the Parks Department, and everybody who was involved in putting together the uh, mountain bike trail project. A tremendous amount of fundraising and uh, and physical labor went into it. It was uh, it was great to be at the at the ribbon cutting, even though Alec could not quite get his uh, son to operate the scissors and cut the ribbon. Um, it was a good effort anyway. Um, and I also want to mention for anyone who's uh, who's watching that there are uh, arrearage assistance programs available for uh, for people who've had uh, income losses due to the uh, coronavirus. And I particularly want to mention that the Public Service Department has an arrearage uh, forgiveness assistance program uh, funded out of COVID funds to enable people to get their electric bills paid if they're uh, if they haven't been able to pay them and that's uh, that's a fund that has been really not reached anywhere near the number of people who probably need it and who who could uh, benefit from it so publicservice.vermont.gov is where you would go and then there's a bunch of stuff after that but uh, i encourage encourage anyone who's had trouble paying their electric bills to uh, to contact the public service department they've made it uh, quite easy to uh, to submit the application and uh, and qualify for funding and uh, if you if you've been managing now because there's been a uh, shut off moratorium in place. It's it's not going to last forever, and you're going to need electricity in this in the winter. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things. Um, one, I wanted to mention that the um, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has been. Um, holding a couple uh, forums, trying to educate the public on this process we're undertaking and also doing some fundraising so we can hopefully expand beyond what um, we have funded through council and the city budget. Um, so there's an event uh, this coming Saturday at 4 p.m. Um, or you can watch a recording if you just wanna learn more about kind of an overview of what the city is undertaking and how you can help. So I hope people will check that out um, and we've been posting information and. Thanks to Cameron for doing a great job staffing that and helping uh, keep that whole thing moving along. Um, and um, this, I just wanted to uh, throw out there for whoever's watching, um, curious what's happening with uh, our wonderful Halloween <laughs> we normally do as a city. I know this is probably more of a popular alive, but I just know we have so many creative and um, you know interesting folks in the city that could probably think of some really good socially distanced fun and it's usually just such a great event and with the local businesses um, in downtown so um, was just kind of curious or hoping lots of good conversations are happening with you know what what that could look like this year and and is there a component that could also be how do we you know safely patronize local businesses and do do something to support our, our downtown community so just wanted to raise that as something I'm interested in exploring um, and anyway I can help um, and the last thing I've talked to a couple business owners especially heading into you know what might be some kind of tourist season with foliage um, and one thing that's come up a few times are some um, business owners just bringing up like trash removal and especially during you know when we're having tourists come wanting our city to be you know the welcoming beautiful um thriving place that it is um and you know, just really staying on top of that is you know one of the things that they're most concerned about so i just want to raise that as well thanks all 
Great. Thank you. Uh, so I also want to add my congratulations to all those who worked on the North Branch trails off of Cumming Street. Uh, very exciting to have those open now. Uh, but I also want to add um, uh, my congratulations to the Cross Vermont Trail folks, because they also had an event this week. Uh, they had a, a groundbreaking. They've raised enough money to uh, start construction of a bridge across the Winooski uh, to, uh, this is like the biggest part, <laughs> the biggest uh, uh, chunk for them uh, in getting the, the Cross Vermont Trail uh, going. And so it was kind of like they were doing the heaviest lift first. And so it's now that this is underway, uh, it makes the, the rest of the process, um, well, a lot, a lot easier, which is great. So this bridge is uh, sort of off, um, off of Gallison Hill, more or less. Uh, so uh, very exciting for them to, and for us really, to be uh, you know, embarking on this and be connected uh, with a, a nice bike path uh, to parts outside of Montpelier. So, uh, so anyway, that's it from me, uh, John. John Odom, are you there? Gone to sleep. No, can you hear me? I haven't gone to sleep. My Zoom isn't coming up. It's very. <laughs> can, you can hear me though. We can hear you. Oh, good. Yeah, where did it go? Um, well, anyways, um, the ballots in the all-mail election um, went out today and yesterday. If uh, you registered to vote in this month. You probably won't see them going out until next Monday, but everybody's getting something. If you don't see them in, you know, a week, week and a half, give me a call if anybody's listening. And there are a number of reasons why you might not have received one, all of them very manageable. But um, so going into with a brief break, another round of completely unknown territory and incredibly busy elections. So the clerk's office is once again going to be all about elections, elections, elections. But we've got our drop box set, set up, including a nifty one in the back. And um, you know, I do need to remind people that for any kind of in-person voting, you're gonna have to sign a little thing that you know either bring in the ballot you're sent or sign something that indicates you're not trying to vote twice. Not that you could do that in our system, but you know we, we expect you to sign the thing anyways. Um, and that in-person voting then, you know, the office is only open Tuesdays and Thursdays. But yeah, so we've got a huge amount of volunteer needs, a huge amount, unprecedented. And I have never seen, people are like falling out of the woodworks to volunteer on this. It's extraordinary. I haven't even had to put the squeeze on people or send out the, the annoying, emails and we're already almost all staffed up not just on election day but through you know the beginning of october all through so um still some out there so you all still get hassled but um yeah it's a weird time but kind of looking good so that's hey john i know mm -hmm. i can ask you this tomorrow but um but for the public for you mentioned people are coming into the clerk's office to vote just so that I'm clear and the public is clear, that would mean bringing in the ballot they were mailed to hand it in. Well, I mean, we won't stop you from voting if you don't. If you don't have the ballot with you that you were sent, then you will be asked to sign a, a, a legal affidavit saying, I'm coming in without my ballot you sent me. I am going to destroy that ballot. And as I say, the system does not allow you to vote more than once. Um, if we punch in one ballot for somebody, they can't send in the other ballot. It will uh, it will not get counted. And in fact, they could get in a little trouble if someone's looking too closely. But if you don't have the ballot with you or you don't bring it, no, we will not stop you from voting in the office. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, for the 28th meeting, we are going to be, we at least technically had scheduled to talk about our legislative priorities. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking our legislative committee, we may wanna to pull together a session in advance of that, just to at least have a draft of something for the council to talk about. 
you may recall what we said we would do was the council would talk about some priorities and come up with a preliminary list, invite the legislators in, you know, in November, and then, you know, hear from them about what's doable, what isn't, their feedback on our list, and then adopt a formal sort of here's our legislative agenda after that meeting. So, that, um, so anyway, just heads up, we'll have to get in touch. I don't think so. And those of you on that committee be thinking about what what that list might look like. In fact, all the rest of you. Uh, just to a couple of the comments that the council made, next meeting we will be going over budget stuff um, and we will be, so we've set that aside, we'll be going over the first quarter finances of the current budget because you probably made budget changes uh, with the idea that we revisit those quarterly and see where they're at. You know, at that, you know, I think when we did this, it was actually with the idea that, gee, things will be getting better and we'll be able to restore things. And I'm not sure that's gonna be the case, at least for the first quarter. Um, but then we'll also be talking about the process coming up and the, the challenges we might be facing. So to Connor's point that we should be thinking about this, it, it, I don't think it will be business as usual. Um, so we're, we're gonna to have to have some hard conversations there. Um, I was trying to think there was something else that somebody said and I know, oh, public bathrooms that will also be on the next agenda. Uh, and Cameron is heading up um, the toilet task force and they are, so they've done a lot of things, but amongst them was to identify existing resources that potentially could be put back into action soon for the, the winter, including city hall, well, you know, I haven't seen the full list, but even, private ones and state, you know, I think there's some at state buildings and since the state is technically supposed to be the lead agency on human services, uh, we're hoping that maybe the very least they could do is open up some of their bathrooms to the public um, to help with this issue. So, um, but we'll know more about that with a, a list of ideas. And then obviously some longer term thinking about where we might construct something. Um, so that's all I have. Okay, well, that is the end of our. Oh, there's we have to make sure to swear in Dan. Yes, John, do, do that. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, because I can't even pull up Zoom at all. So I'm just like talking to a magic screen. So I'm glad you're all <laughs> hear me. I can't hear you. So, so no face to face here, but it is legal to do this. I've checked um, over the phone, so I assume over video conference is even better. So. Dan, I'm counting on you to raise your right hand here because I can't see you. Um, then there's two oaths, as you probably yeah. remember. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont and that you will not directly or indirectly do any act or thing injurious to the Constitution or government thereof, so help you God, or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the office of City Council representative of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority for the City of Montpelier and will there do equal right and justice to all persons to the best of your judgment and ability according to law, so help you God or under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. All right. You are duly sworn. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> okay. I think that is the end of our our business. Uh, so, right. yeah. So, without uh, objection, I will consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Bye, all. Bye. Good night. Good night.